We're meeting today to discuss with Secretary Becerra the budget and the Department of Health and Human Services. The President's budget comes down to a simple proposition. Helping working families and the middle class get ahead and reducing the federal deficit are not mutually exclusive. So today, we're committed to doing both. When it comes to health care, that means protecting Medicare for the next generation by making sure that the wealthy pay their fair share in taxes, strengthening Medicare's negotiating power for the cost of prescription medicine, and investing in priorities like mental health care, home-based care, and the health care workforce. That's a sharp contrast to the Republican approach to the federal budget. Since the beginning of the year, there's basically been a demand for secret negotiations on unspecified cuts to federal programs while holding hostage the full faith and credit of the United States government. Budget Committee Chair Whitehouse and I asked the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office to run the numbers, and it's clear that Republican promises to spare certain parts of the budget, like Social Security, simply don't add up. Sparing essential lifelines for seniors in addition to Republican priorities means essentially zeroing out everything else in the federal budget. I would like to take a moment to address press reports that some House members are considering proposals that cut earned benefits in Medicare or Social Security for those who are not yet at retirement age. I want to be clear. As long as As I'm chair of this committee, I will fight any effort to engage in intergenerational warfare. There are plenty of ideas to improve the financial health of these programs that do not include forfeiting the earned benefits of current workers. Now, I'm going to take a minute to talk about what that means in practical terms, starting with Medicaid. Contrary to popular belief, Medicaid acts as our country's backstop for nursing home care, not Medicare. And since my days as director of the Great Panthers, I've been stunned at how many people still believe Medicare leads in the effort to fund nursing home care. That's just not accurate. It's Medicaid. That means when your parents are in their 80s or 90s and require nursing home care, Medicaid is there to help cover the cost once they have essentially gone through all the hard-earned retirement savings and everything they did to try to plan for retirement while they were working. If Republicans go after Medicaid the way they did in 2017 by cutting federal support to state Medicaid programs and giving states free reign to pare back benefits, that guaranteed backstop of nursing home care for seniors is ripped away. That means a return to times from distant memory before the social safety net was created when older Americans who ran out of savings and couldn't count on a family member were essentially consigned to a poor farm. Nobody wants America to return to that way. So let's look for ways to work together to take on the big challenges of our time rather than pursuing reckless cuts that imperil the country's older people. Now, a couple of important priorities in the President's budget. First, on prescription drugs. The President's budget has several bold proposals to build on the Inflation Reduction Act that holds pharma accountable for years of high prices while lowering costs for seniors. That includes speeding up Medicare negotiations and increasing the number of drugs subject to negotiation. I strongly support this approach, especially as the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services continues to steadily implement the laws that are already on the books. For example, last week, the Biden administration announced that the anti-price gouging law that was written in this committee, in this room, on a bipartisan basis in 2019 will lower coinsurance payments for 27 drugs in Medicare Part B. Part B pays for prescription drugs to treat diseases like cancer and rheumatoid arthritis administered in a physician's office. That includes Humira and folks Humira is exhibit A for why drug pricing reforms were needed in the first place. Important steps like these co-insurance reductions, free vaccines, 
and the insulin cost cap in Medicare are just the beginning of the big league impact this law will have on Americans' health care costs. And I want to make clear, I've said from the beginning that when the federal government leads on flagship health reforms in Medicare and in its key programs, we know as sure as the night as follows the day that the private sector is going to follow, and that is exactly what's happened. Next, mental health care. Very fitting since my seatmate here has been the leader here in the Senate of that cause, Senator Stabenow. Last Congress, the committee wrote black letter law to move the country towards a reality where all Americans can get quality mental health care when and where they need it. I especially want to thank uh, my partner here on the Finance Committee, Senator Crapo. At the beginning of 2021, we said on mental health care, we are going to be ready on every single bill, every single one, to make sure that we advance the cause of mental health needs. And we were able to do that on the gun safety uh, law with improved mental health care in schools, funding for community behavioral health centers, led as I mentioned by Senator Stabenow, coverage for therapists in Medicare, new GME slots for psychiatrists. And Senator Crapo and I talk often about this and we intend to continue our mental health work in this Congress, again, in a bipartisan uh, way. Now, one final point with respect to mental health care to clear up a little confusion. When it comes to mental health parity, the Congress passed a landmark law in 2008 based on the proposition that physical and mental health would be treated equally. That, unfortunately, doesn't happen today. Fifteen years after the law was written, written, the insurance companies, the big insurance companies, are still finding ways to drag their feet on carrying out the parity law with respect to mental health. So the challenge for the committee is to stop the foot dragging that is taking place under current law, colleagues. A 2008 law and develop fresh approaches to give Americans what they thought they were getting in 2008. The President's budget takes important steps in that direction, and I'm pleased that Senator Bennett uh, also is leading the way to put mental health care on a better uh, footing. We're also pleased that the President's budget takes a big step when it comes to postpartum coverage for new mothers in Medicaid. At the end of last year, Congress came together on a bipartisan basis to create an option for every state to cover postpartum care for new mothers for 12 months. The president's step, uh, budget, to its credit, takes the next step to make that coverage available for the country. Finally, I want to say I think all of us had a chance over the last few days to read a stunning report about cracks in uh, the health care uh, system for disabled uh, folks that was reported on the Washington Post. We're going to need to develop smarter policies that provide long-term care options for families to get uh, the care uh, that is best uh, for them. One option is offered by our colleague from Pennsylvania, Senator Casey, for home and community-based uh, services, and we're going to continue to promote that. So this is all about making some smart investments in better health for the people of this country, consistent with showing that you can do that while reducing the federal budget deficit. After Senator Crapo uh, has a chance to make his opening remarks, we'll introduce Senator Becerra and we will get underway. Senator Crapo. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you, Secretary Becerra, for being here today. Uh, before we begin, let me let you know, I have to, at this very time, be introducing a judicial nominee for an Idaho district judge position. So when I finish my remarks and I step out, I'm not walking out on you. Uh, I will be back. Um, and uh, before I get to my, my prepared remarks, I, I do want to respond a little bit on the question about the debt ceiling negotiations. Uh, I want to make it very clear. Uh, the Republicans are asking for negotiations on the debt ceiling process to add some fiscal restraint into the debt ceiling extension. And I ask you, Secretary Becerra, to uh, take back to the President my plea that he engage with us in negotiations. I want to make it clear. We are not talking about trying to reduce benefits in Medicare or Social Security for our seniors. What we are talking about is reasonable reforms that can help us get to some kind of fiscal restraint on our spiraling debt. And I just encourage all of my colleagues in the Senate, but particularly the President, to engage with us in those kinds of negotiations. I want to start my formal remarks uh, on the positive. 
you've testified before and have talked to me privately about the fact that although we have our differences on a lot of different policy areas, we want to find those areas where we can work together, and we've found some last year. Last year, as Senator Wyden has already indicated, we came together on a package of bipartisan reforms to produce common sense solutions, ranging from mental health improvements to comprehensive telehealth coverage for seniors and working families. Moreover, we accomplished all of this by reducing the deficit by billions of dollars. And the administration and you, Secretary Becerra, worked with us on this, and we've made good progress. I look forward to partnering with HHS as well as with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to advance further reforms like this in this Congress to improve health care access, affordability, and choice for all Americans. That being said, I do have concerns with the budget that the President has put forward. Unfortunately, many of the proposals in the President's budget run directly counter to these types of initiatives that I've discussed. I have serious concerns with the focus on partisan policies that risk harming health care access and affordability for both current and future patients. We talked about some of this yesterday. The budget's central proposal, for instance, would dramatically expand the size and scope of the bureaucratic government-run drug pricing program enacted last year in the IRA. Prior to that law's passage, my Republican colleagues and I warned repeatedly that imposing sweeping price controls would prove disastrous for patients, biomedical research and development, and domestic manufacturing jobs. And many of our fears have already come to pass. We pointed to the risk of higher launch prices and distorted pricing practices based on projections validated by the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office. And sure enough, the Wall Street Journal reported in January, and I quote, the impact in 2023 may actually be higher drug prices. We also expressed concerns around life-saving R&D as a University of Chicago study estimated the IRA would result in 135 fewer new drug approvals in the next two decades. That figure would inevitably skyrocket under the budget's proposed expansion. Already, numerous manufacturers have signaled plans to table certain projects in light of uncertainty created by the IRA. In recent months, we've also seen a rash of drug shortages which even leading U.S. Food and Drug Administration officials have attributed to pricing dynamics. Doubling down on the IRA's price controls would exacerbate the law's most harmful consequences. Americans deserve better and more affordable access to prescription drugs, and we can find bipartisan, results-oriented solutions to advance that goal. Government price mandates, however, are a step in the wrong direction. I've also profound concerns with the budget's bold claims of averting the Medicare Hospital Insurance Trust Fund's looming insolvency, largely through massive tax hikes and budget gimmicks. This unbalanced approach does nothing to address Medicare's cost drivers. It would also punish the small job business, the small business job creators and entrepreneurs who drive our economy. Unfortunately, the budget takes a similarly short-sighted approach to Medicaid reviving a number of rejected policies from past proposals, including hundreds of billions in new spending tied to burdensome conditions and efforts to circumvent state leaders. The federal government should focus on supporting states as they work to return Medicaid to post-pandemic normalcy rather than imposing new top-down mandates. Instead of turning to a one-size-fits-all solution, we should look to proven models for federal programs, such as Medicare Advantage. With sky-high patient satisfaction rates, Medicare Advantage shows that consumer choice and market forces can produce more benefits and better outcomes. As we move forward, I encourage your department, Mr. Secretary, to focus on our shared goals, from cost-cutting competition to sustainable telehealth access and other similar issues, rather than on these partisan priorities. I thank you again for being here today, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank, I thank my, my colleague, and my colleague and I aren't going to go back and forth about who said what when. I'm just going to put into the record uh, by unanimous uh, consent at this point the House Republican Study Committee proposals to cut Medicaid and Medicare. So specifically, that's what we're talking about. So, uh, Secretary you know, Becerra, we welcome you, 25th 
Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, first Latino to hold the office in the history of the United States. You have dedicated your career to public service, most recently serving as the Attorney General of California from 2017 to 2021. Prior to that post, he served 12 terms in Congress as a member of the House of Representatives. While serving in Congress, he was the first Latino member of the Committee on Ways and Means. He served as ranking member of the Ways and Means Subcommittee on Social Security and ranking member of the Subcommittee on Health. Secretary, we welcome you. I've appreciated the chance to work with you often uh, over uh, the years and uh, uh, appreciate your commitment to advocating, advocating for the people served by the Department of Health and Human Services. And go ahead with your remarks. Chairman Wyden and Ranking Member Crapo and to all the members, thank you for the invitation. A lot has happened in the years since I last spoke to you about budgets. More than 16 million Americans have secured health insurance through the Affordable Care Act marketplaces. That's an all-time high. Altogether, more than 300 million Americans now carry insurance to cover their health care needs, a historic high as well. The President's new lower-cost prescription drug law has capped insulin at $35 per month and made preventative vaccines like the flu, COVID, and shingles vaccines available for free under Medicare. Moving forward, this new law gives us the right to finally negotiate lower prescription drug prices for Americans. And to cap it all off, the Biden-Harris administration has safely and effectively executed the largest adult vaccine program in U.S. history, achieving nearly 700 million shots in arms during the COVID pandemic without charge. The FY 2024 budget proposes $144 billion in discretionary funding and $1.7 trillion in mandatory funding for HHS. It positions us to tackle the urgent challenges we face, including a growing behavioral health crisis and future public health threats. It also funds operations and mission-critical infrastructure needed to build a healthier America, moving the nation from an illness care system to a wellness care system. An illness care system leaves our most vulnerable families behind. A wellness care system invests in providing the full spectrum of health care to all Americans. Illness care allows the price of prescription drugs to skyrocket. Wellness care starts by prescribing fruits, vegetables, and exercise. It treats food as medicine. Illness care requires you to get a referral by your family physician to see a specialist for mental health services. Wellness care? Well, it lets you get mental health care the moment you walk through the door of your family physician's office. Illness care forces hardworking Americans to deplete their life savings to get the long-term care they need. Wellness care, it invests early in long-term care, like in-home care, so our older American adults and our Americans with disabilities can thrive at home and in their communities. Our budget invests in wellness care. We invest more than $30 billion to prepare us for the next COVID or public health crisis, including a billion dollars to replenish our nation's strategic national stockpile. Our behavioral, on behavioral health, too many of our loved ones are dying from suicide or overdose, so we increase access to crisis care. We grow the behavioral health workforce, and we beef up substance use services. We are also gearing up to handle more than 6 million additional contacts from people who are experiencing a mental health crisis through 988, the three-digit suicide prevention lifeline we stood up last year. This budget covers two million adults left out by Medicaid by their home states and extends tax credits that make health care more affordable for millions of Americans. It would also ensure that expanded postpartum Medicaid coverage for a new mom and her baby is here to stay. The President's budget not only strengthens Medicare for today's seniors, but protects and strengthens it for the next generation. We also take care of our family members in this budget, investing $600 billion in child care and preschool programs and $150 billion to strengthen Medicaid home and community-based services. This budget funds the Cancer Moonshot, ARPA-H. It invests in the Title X Family Planning Program essential to so many of our families. It delivers on our commitments made as part of the National Strategy for Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. It opens more community health centers. And important to me as a former Attorney General, it bolsters our health care fraud and abuse detection and enforcement work. And the President's budget honors our responsibilities to Indian country with more than $2 billion in new resources in 2024. Last year, for the first time, you gave the Indian Health Service advanced appropriations, providing the same protection against budget uncertainty that other health services receive. 
We hope to build on that progress this year. This budget reflects the President's and our values and commitments. It helps begin the move from a nation focused on illness care to one about wellness care. And most importantly, it ensures health and wellness are within the reach for all Americans. On behalf of the women and men of the Department of Health and Human Services, we look forward to working with you, and I thank you for having me today. Mr. Secretary, thank you. I'll start it off with respect to the trust fund. Now, the President and Democrats are committed to protecting what we've always called Medicare's guarantee. Medicare is not some kind of voucher. It's a guarantee of high-quality health care, and Americans have earned this benefit with each paycheck. So with this budget, the President is focused on making sure billionaires and the very wealthy pay their fair share. We'd strengthen Medicare's negotiating authority and lower the price of more prescription drugs and extend Medicare's solvency for 25 years. Now, what we're hearing from the other side is giving a free pass to billionaires. All these budgets work it out so that billionaires basically are left untouched. And now we're seeing the full faith and credit of the United States being threatened. So what I'd like to do is make sure that you have a chance to make it clear what the differences are with respect to these issues. The President's budget, in my view, does not cut Medicare benefits by taking steps like raising the eligibility age, reducing access to care, or basically just handing everything over to a bunch of big insurance companies. Is that factually correct? Senator, the President made it very clear. He will not propose any budget that cuts benefits under Medicare for the 67 million people who today count on Medicare and to the millions more who are added every year. Uh, he would, in fact, increase benefits at the same time that he's strengthening the program for the future generations to come. And so it's a proposal that was due because so many presidents have come before President Biden and never offered a proposal. I, for 24 years in Congress, never saw Congress try to tackle this in a serious way. Finally, we have a president who says, here's how we do it, and we can not only strengthen Medicare, but we can do it without cutting one benefit for any senior in America. All right, let's move on to prescription drugs and uh, the implementation of the Inflation Reduction uh, Act. And I think you heard me mention right here in this room with Senator Grassley, Senator Stabenow was here, Senator Crapo was here. That's where we locked in the first ever set of financial penalties for price gouging in Medicare. And we saw the benefits of this this week with the reductions in coinsurance that's gonna be of help to millions of people. That was done in 2019 in this room, in a bipartisan way. So we wanna keep building on that. Uh, CMS is working on a tight <coughs> timeline with respect to the drug pricing reforms. And there's a lot to do in advance of the September 1 announcement of which 10 drugs will be the first to go forward on the negotiation process. Last week, as I indicated, was an important milestone with the release of the proposed Medicare price negotiation guidance. This is in addition to the implementation of the penalties for price gouging. And you and I have talked about that. It's so important that the uh, Inflation Reduction Act guidelines um, are met and we ensure that uh, the people who are participating in this program are ready and that the law delivers for seniors and the public. So my first question to you, and you and I have, have talked about uh, this, um, is it possible for you today to commit to a timely release of the final negotiation guidance which would come about this summer? Senator, that's, that's our goal. We've never done this before. We thank you for the resources to try to do it right. We understand that September is a magical date when we announce the 10 drugs that will be part of the first negotiation. 
Uh, we will continue to work with you. I'm committed to make, to make sure that each and every member in the Senate and the House has the information they need to see where we're going. And because you were gracious in giving us the resources to, to staff up, we hope to not only meet the, the, the deadlines, but hopefully beat them. We look forward to working with you really month by month to meet this September uh, deadline. And you and I have, have talked about this before. This was an extraordinary victory for the millions of seniors who would stand in those pharmacy lines and felt like they were getting mugged by the prices. And pharma you know, protected this ban on negotiation like they were protecting the holy grail. And Senator Stabenow and so many others you know, kept making, you know, making the case, of course you ought to negotiate. There are more than 50 million seniors on Medicare. Who in the world doesn't negotiate? So last week's announcements were very good with respect to price gouging, with respect to the list for negotiation. Um, we're moving ahead to make sure this gets implemented. Tell me a little bit about what the American people can expect to be told as this goes forward and how it impacts them. And then I'll uh, yield to my colleagues. Mr. Chairman, I, I believe we're going to not only be transparent uh, with you and your colleagues, but with the American public of how we're going about selecting those drugs, uh, the process in which we are going to engage the manufacturers uh, in this. We want them to be able to participate as much as possible in a public setting so people can see how they behave in this process of negotiation. And let's let the American people see. Uh, sunshine is the best disinfectant, as they say, and we have no problem with that. Very good. Thank you. Senator Stabenow will be next. Thank you very much, and <clears throat> welcome, Secretary. Um, I feel like there's so many different things we could talk about that are so important and are making a difference uh, in people's lives, and, and thank you, thank the President uh, for, uh, for doing what you are, are doing. Uh, first, I, I do want to recognize I have a lot of friends in purple shirts here from the Alzheimer's Association, and we want to celebrate not only, I think over the years now, something like a 700% increase in research, which is so critical, and efforts we have done to support caregivers, and the next step is making sure that <clears throat> patients have the critical and urgent treatments that they need. And so I will be following up with you more on that. But uh, this is the moment to, to, uh, uh, to really build on that. And so um, I, uh, I appreciate that they're all here with us uh, this week. Uh, let me start also by saying that Medicare and Social Security are great American success stories, lifted a generation of seniors and people with disabilities out of poverty. We certainly are not going to go backwards. At least certainly the majority in the United States Senate is not going to go backwards. When the chairman talks about uh, the House Republican Study Group budget, which is uh, one that, that uh, has been lifted up as a major uh, foundation for what the House is talking about, it raises the age of Medicare to 70, raises the age of Social Security to 70. They, I, I can't imagine um, doing that or, or privatizing the systems, turning them over to Wall Street or private insurance companies. So um, I congratulate you and I congratulate the President for going in a different direction, which is to strengthen uh, Medicare and to focus on the costs on prescription drugs and so on as we, we move things um, in the right direction for people. Um, you know I have to talk about mental health. I have to talk about certified community behavioral health clinics. I'm so excited that this is something that we have done on a bipartisan basis. I see Senator uh, Cornyn here. We worked really hard together on the, um, the uh, Safer Communities Act and really have the uh, most, uh, the strongest investment in mental health and addiction services literally in 50 years, and that's not an exaggeration. And so thank you for working on that, as well as our chairman and, and ranking member who have been so pivotal in all of it. Um, we are now, we've had a demonstration project with 10 states fully funded, like healthcare, uh, with uh, clinics, quality clinics, 24-hour emergency services. We're now working on the next piece you uh, announced, um, 
Uh, SAMHSA has uh, the process for identifying the next 10 states. We're working, we want to get that all the way to 50. But I'm, I would like you to elaborate a little more on your plans for this really transformative system. We're moving from grants, grants are good, but much better to have this be an integral part of our healthcare system with ongoing funding and support, support for staff, the work that this committee did in expanding uh, Medicare access for therapists and, and so on, and the GME slots for psychiatrists at the end of the year, really important work that we've done. But could you expand a little bit on um, this program and vision around uh, uh, community behavioral health? Yeah, and I have to begin, Senator, by thanking you, Senator Corden, and others who really championed this. Uh, your fingerprints are all over this expansion of community, certified community behavioral health centers, and thank God, because we know that mental illness doesn't end at five o'clock. It, it goes forward, and at midnight, three in the morning, you need to have someone you can turn to, and that's where these certified community behavioral health centers will be indispensable. The fact that we're gonna to try to give them a permanent stream of funding, so they're not open just nine to five, or they're not open just the first five months of the, of the year, and then they run out of money. This has a consistency, and we know that for folks who are going through a mental health crisis, they're looking for some stability. And so this helps add that at all hours, all days in the year, and we're gonna build on this. You started with a project, a pilot, and now you see what's happening. And it's great that we're also gonna be able to help those states that started off in those projects to expand as well, because what a shame if the states that first took the leap and showed its success would be deprived of the chance to expand this. So thank you very much to you and your colleagues for what you've done. Well, I'm really thrilled that in the president's budget, he makes the certified community behavioral health clinics permanent, which is so critical. And I have to say, this was a, a major bipartisan uh, accomplishment. And while he's no longer in the Senate, uh, my partner, Senator Roy Blunt, was integral to this. And so uh, shout out to uh, Senator Blunt as well. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank my colleague. Next to be Senator Crapo. In the next three, it's a <clears throat> very hectic day up here. I'm the secretary, as you know, on, uh, on Wednesdays at, uh, at this point. The next three in order of appearance would be Grassley, Menendez, and Cornyn. So next, Senator Crapo. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I think I'll start out with uh, Alzheimer's. As Senator Stavano mentioned, we have a number of, of our Alzheimer's friends here with us today. The FDA's accelerated approval pathway has provided a lifeline for countless Americans advancing access to safe and effective medicines for cancer, rare diseases, HIV, and other conditions like Alzheimer's years before these treatments could otherwise come to the market. Unfortunately, this administration has taken unprecedented steps to erode this pathway, deterring life-saving innovation and delaying access to care. This troubling trend began with CMS's coverage restrictions for an entire class of Alzheimer's therapies, and it seems to set to continue with the recently announced accelerating clinical evidence model, which would slash payments for treatments that rely on accelerated approval. Secretary Becerra, I recently let, led a letter urging the administration to abandon this misguided model, given the potential for slower and slimmer pipelines of new medicines for seniors, among other serious conditions. I also wrote to you last year about the grave implications of the Alzheimer's coverage decision. How does your department plan to ensure that accelerated approval pathways remain a robust and viable option for innovators and, most importantly, for patients? Senator Crapo, you've uh, touched on something very important uh, for me, having my father, my in-laws, my father-in-law and mother-in-law, dementia, the last years, last months of life, uh, very tough. We were there. My father died in my home. We cared for him. Same with my mother-in-law and father-in-law. My, my wife and her siblings cared for them. Um, this is tough. Dementia hits all of us, not just the, the patient, and we want to be there. And we're fortunate that in America, we're coming up with new innovative treatments and we're doing everything we can to accelerate them. I, I give you the evidence of the COVID vaccine. No one expected that the COVID vaccine would come out so quickly. Whether it's Alzheimer's, COVID, uh, hepatitis C, we're moving and we wanna be there and we'll look for every innovative approach, every pathway possible to make sure that one, we can put a uh, a safe and effective drug in front of the American people, and then also determine whether it will be covered by Medicare. 
Well, I understand that, uh, that commitment, but the, the accelerated model that you had adopted or are looking to adopt and pursue is going in exactly the opposite direction. I encourage you to revisit this model. Let me move on to Medicare Advantage. CMS recently released their annual advance notice, which included some significant changes to the Medicare Advantage risk model for the upcoming bid process. We've heard concerns from providers, patients, and plans that these changes will disproportionately impact the most vulnerable MA beneficiaries, including those with low incomes or chronic conditions. Mr. Secretary, does the administration plan to address these concerns in its final MA rule? Senator, thanks for the question. Uh, nearly half of all seniors who have Medicare use the Medicare managed care model. Uh, this is critically important. We are absolutely going to make sure that when the final uh, gavel falls on this, it will not only move us in the right direction with more efficiency, but it also will protect every Medicare benefit for seniors and disabled Americans who use the Medicare program. Well, thank you. And I encourage you to look at this carefully, and if you haven't already done it, to conduct an impact analysis to determine, to determine how the model you're currently considering change, changes to would affect different groups of beneficiaries. I think you'll find that, uh, once again, these proposals are going in the wrong direction. Let me move on to one where we can agree. <laughs> That's on telehealth. As the budget request mentions, my colleagues and I came together late last year to advance a crucial two-year extension of wide-ranging telehealth flexibilities, including for Medicare beneficiaries. Without further action, however, these policies will expire at the end of 2024, creating a coverage cliff for tens of millions of seniors across the country. Secretary Becerra, I realize this requires Congress to get engaged and, and involved, but from the administration's perspective, how should Medicare telehealth coverage look in the longer term? And can you commit to working with Congress to develop meaningful solutions that will protect access well beyond the end of next year? Yes, Senator, this one's crucial. We absolutely will work with you because we don't want those statutory uh, flexibilities to expire. We're going to need your help. Thank you for the leadership you've demonstrated over the past on this one. We, for example, want to make sure that everyone has the broadband that will make telehealth work. We want to make sure that everyone can use a doctor wherever that doctor is located. That requires the states to work with us to make sure we might be at across state borders. We want to make sure that if you're in rural America or inner city uh, America, you don't have to worry that you don't have a way to get to the doctor. You'll have access to telehealth. Well, thank you, and encourage us as strongly as you can to get that legislatively done. Yeah. I know Senator Wyden and I are working very closely together on this, and I just want some strong support from the administration. Thank, thank you, Senator Crapo, and you're right. We are working together on a number of these issues. I just want, very quickly, before we go to Senator Grassley, to say we very much appreciate having Alzheimer's uh, advocates in the House today. My mother was at Channing House in Palo Alto for years and years on end with Alzheimer's, and um, they were one of the countries and continue to be one of the country's leading institutions in terms of dementia care and Alzheimer's. So you're hearing this from uh, all of us up here that were committed to uh, working with you. The other point I wanted to mention involves the medicines, the drugs. And that is, I am a very strong supporter of accelerated approval for these very exciting new drugs for Alzheimer's. My colleague and seatmate, Senator Stabenow, still trying to persuade her to not retire, uh, <laughs> is leading the cause in terms of these new medicines. It's just very important to remember what was agreed to originally, and that was when you have accelerated approval so we can make sure we're keeping our commitments to these patients, it would be followed up by the drug companies presenting evidence of the progress with respect to how the drugs are working on patients and, and working with patients. And that was part of the accelerated pathway in 1992. So I want all the folks who are doing this wonderful work advocating for patients. We're going to support you. We're going to look for research. We're going to look for new medicines. The accelerated approval is part of it, and the pharmaceutical companies have agreed after the drug is approved to continue to furnish evidence of its progress, and that's very important. Mr. Secretary, you remember that was what Dr. Califf agreed with me uh, when we were considering his nomination. Senator Grassley. Yeah. 
Thank you very much, and thank you, Madam. Uh, Two thank yous. Uh, first of all, you uh, very quickly uh, instituted the over the hearing aid hearing aid law that uh, Senator Warren and I sponsored. I also want to thank you for enabling the transition health plans to continue, because 65,000 Iowans are benefiting from that action, and many of these people are farmers and small business owners. Letting them continue has been a bipartisan priority under President Obama, Trump, and now Biden. So I hope HHS allows them to continue uh, in the future beyond 2024. Now let me go to my first question. Uh, members of this committee, including uh, this senator, uh, investigating the deadly failures of our nation's organ donation system the Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network. I've been looking into this uh, network uh, a long, long period of time. Uh, the problems have gotten worse. Uh, thousands of patients are dying every year, and billions of taxpayers' dollars are wasted because of gross mismanagement. The system is rife with fraud, waste and abuse, corruption, and even criminality. Uh, this committee has received credible allegations regarding the United Network for Organ Sharing uh, relating uh, uh, that organization threatening whistleblowers, including even patients and caregivers. Simply put, this is uh, beyond unacceptable. Uh, these efforts appear to be part of an attempt to cover up failures and prevent competition uh, for its uh, government contract. So question to you, uh, I hope that you can commit to fully investigating all instance, instances of whistleblower retaliation and harassment. Uh, would the HHS commit to removing anyone involved in that improper conduct from any involvement in the organ, organ procurement and transplantation network leadership and committees, and if you don't agree with me, why not? Senator uh, Grassley, first, uh, thank you for the work that you've done. As you mentioned, this has taken a long time, and thank God that you've committed to it. Um, on the whistleblower question, we are absolutely committed to working with you to make sure that if there is a claim made about uh, a particular operation, we, we dive right into it to find out what's going on. But let me give you the more important news. Today we are announcing at HHS that we are going to put forward a modernization initiative which will do a number of things that I think you're gonna like. One, we're gonna call for competition in who becomes the contractor for these uh, organ uh, procurement and, and uh, the transplant services. And so it will no longer be just one company that the way it's been for what, 40 years. So that's one big change that will occur. Secondly, we're gonna require transparency they, they got to start sharing their data. They can't hide, as you just said, behind this confidentiality and say, we can't show you what's gone on because it's confidential. We're going to require far more data transparency. Again, this follows all the work that you've done. And then finally, we're going to try to upgrade the IT system, which, as you can imagine, with these contractors never having changed, uh, everything gets stale. So does the IT. We're going to try to update the IT so we can be efficient with those organs that we receive so we can get them to someone instead of have them ultimately be discarded because they didn't get used in time. Those are things we're uh, ad announcing today. And in the president's budget, he calls for resources so we can implement this. So we're absolutely going to call on you for your help to try to move this forward, get your input. But uh, again, mu much of what we're announcing today is a result of the work that you've done over the years. Thank you for your initiative. I want to turn to rural health care. Uh, I want to thank the administration for implementing the new involuntary rural emerg emergency hospital program that I've uh, worked for uh, three or four years to get passed. Another rural hospital program that you may not know so much about is called the Rural Community Hospital Demonstration. It extends the financial viability of 26 small rural hospitals in 11 different states, five in Iowa. 
uh, the program has taken up to uh, ha has taken up to 30 hospitals, but CMS is currently underutilizing the program. Congress has authorized the program for several more years. While there is interest in rural hospital participating, uh, CMS has told me that they have no interest in uh, filling the four uh, additional slots. Uh, I realize that you may not know much about this program. Do you think that we should be, uh, uh, do you think we should be under utilizing cost effective rural hospital programs like the rural community hospital demonstration? That's uh, Senator, I, I am familiar with the program and we are making a, a concerted effort in rural America to inject some life into some of these facilities because as, as you know very well, too many of them are closing and they're not being replaced. And when they are being replaced, they're first being gutted of some of the essential services that they used to provide. So we have dedicated services into uh, rural community hospitals, but we're gonna try to do more. And we certainly will uh, take your lead on some of these initiatives because we know that those of you who go back home every day and have to deal with those providers know exactly where they, what they need and where they need to go. So we'll look forward to working with you. While he's in the room, let me thank uh, Senator Grassley for working in such a bipartisan way over the years to improve this system with respect to, uh, to organs and uh, organ procurement. Yesterday, there was, in my view, a big victory for families across the country who've been fighting for a more effective organ procurement and transportation system. The administration indicated they work with us to have more competition in this UNOS contract. This committee has felt on a bipartisan basis that there hasn't been enough competition for the contract and uh, uh, meeting the expectations of Americans waiting for a transplant. So I want to thank my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, Senator Grassley in particular, has been at this for years and look forward to working closely with him. Senator Menendez is next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before I go to my question, I just simply want to say I want to echo your comments as someone whose mother had a 10-year long goodbye with Alzheimer's. Uh, we have a moral as well as an economic imperative uh, to end Alzheimer's uh, in our time. And so I hope the budget will reflect that uh, as well. <coughs> Mr. Secretary, for years, communities across the country have struggled to fill major provider workforce gaps, a growing crisis exacerbated by the pandemic. I've long championed legislation to address the physician shortage by increasing the number of Medicare-funded graduate medical education slots. And based on my legislation, the Re Resident Physician Shortage Reduction Act, Congress authorized the creation of 1,000 <coughs> new Medicare-funded GME slots in the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. And it outlined specific eligibility criteria for distributing these slots. However, the kingdom of CMS uh, is final rule uh, for 2022, and again in 2023, included additional criteria not specified in the law. This additional location-specific prioritization unfairly disadvantages states who have few geographic or population HPSAs. As a result, New Jersey and other states were completely, completely shut out from obtaining these critical residency positions. The CIA of 2021 clearly specifies that the secretary shall, not may, shall, can distribute up to 200 residency positions each year and shall distribute not less than 10% of the residency positions to each of four specified categories of providers. That's the law. That's what Congress's intent was. Now, I raised this with CMS last year. They failed to address this issue. Can I have your commitment to work with me to revise the methodology used to distribute future residency positions so that we follow Congress's intent, the law, and states are not totally shut out of this program? Senator, first, thank you very much for the work you've done on graduate medical education, and absolutely, you have my commitment to work with you on this. Thank you. Now, I'm concerned that the proposed advance notice Medicare Advantage rate announcement will create further health disparities for the 640,000 Medicare Advantage beneficiaries in Puerto Rico. As you know, Puerto Rico seniors overwhelmingly depend on the MA program, with an MA penetration rate of 94% among beneficiaries eligible for Medicare Parts A and B. The proposed changes could impose the largest 
year-to-year -year reduction in federal health funding to Puerto Rico, a change that is harmful not only to the most vulnerable beneficiaries, but to the island's health care system and economy, one that we have been working towards improving. This is going to set them back. Further, the MA program in Puerto Rico supports health access and equity by filling gaps in care resulting from the island's exclusion from many other federal health benefits. I'm concerned these changes could undermine progress we've made to date to address disparities on the island, including recent funding gains achieved for the Medicaid program, which I fought for. What is the administration's plan to ensure any proposed changes are not magnifying disparities and reducing services provided to beneficiaries on the island who are United States citizens? Senator, thank you for the question. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, when 67 million people count on Medicare, about half of them count on it within the managed care program of Medicare, we have to make sure we get it right. We're in the process of reviewing, reviewing all the comments that we received based on that advance notice. And what the President said is we will guarantee that there will be no cuts to the benefits under Medicare in this proposal, that uh, the providers will see, uh, in most cases, uh, a, an increase, a substantial increase in some cases, uh, to the monies they're receiving, reimbursement monies they're receiving. Yeah, and this is, with they, all due respect, this is in the broader context. But you've got to look at Puerto Rico specifically in the disproportionate way it gets affected. And so I'm worried that while we're talking broadly, the effect in Puerto Rico for the 3.5 million United States citizens is disproportionate. So I'm, I'm going to follow up with a letter regarding Medicare Advantage in Puerto Rico, urging uh, you to address anomalies in the rate formula to mitigate funding disparities for the island. Look forward and to that. Finally, uh, last month, the New York Times published a disturbing report on the use of illegal use of migrant child labor by several major companies. Some as young as 13-year-olds are unaccompanied minors who came to the United States, placed with sponsors by the Office of Refugee Resettlement, uh, often made to work long hours in hazardous conditions. What are we doing to make sure that that does not happen again? And Senator, uh, like you, uh, I have three daughters. Uh, children are children. We should treat every child in America the way we would expect to have our children treated. Uh, it is a serious issue when someone claims that a child is being forced to, to work especially in dangerous conditions. And we take very seriously our role at uh, HHS to make sure that while we have custody of a child, and remember, we receive custody of these uh, unaccompanied migrant kids from the Department of Homeland Security. When we do, we are obligated to provide them with the care that you would expect for a child while we're in the process of trying to find them a suitable setting to live in because a, a, a large congregate, congregate care setting is not the most ideal for any child. And so we go through the process of trying to look for a sponsor. We go through a vetting process where we vet all uh, potential sponsors. And, what, and by the way, almost all, uh, about 90% of those sponsors end up being uh, a family member, an immediate family member. And so what we try to do is make sure that when we do finally uh, place that child in the hands of a sponsor, that they will receive the care that they're supposed to. What we're finding is that oftentimes a lot of these children are now and being employed, and I hope that we go aggressively. You, we all go aggressively, and any employer that would think that it's right to allow a 12 or 13 year old to work in conditions that aren't even safe for adults. And that's where we have to go and make sure that we're not failing children. And that's why we announced that in a joint effort, uh, the Department of Labor and the Department of Health and Human Services will work, will work to try to make sure that we can do what we can within our jurisdiction to avoid that happening. At HHS, that means trying to get sight from DOL if they know of a particular individual who's seeking to be a sponsor who may be engaged in the practice of using or employing or allowing kids to be employed in ways that are detrimental to them. And we're going to try to do the best we can to make sure we have that sight early so that none, no sponsor like that would ever pass our vetting process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank my colleague, and I want my colleague to know I appreciate his leadership, and I especially want to help with that last point that you made. This is outrageous, that companies are exploiting 12-year-olds. In order to make a quick buck, they are taking advantage of these kids. It's outrageous, and look forward to working with you and following your lead. Senator Cornyn. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Last year, approximately 108,000 Americans died of drug overdoses, including 71,000 roughly from synthetic opioids like fentanyl. 
Um, do you believe we have a public health crisis when it comes to these overdose deaths? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And one reason why we have this public health crisis, which you and I both recognize as such, is because we've lost control of our southern border. We've seen uh, millions of people show up, uh, some claiming asylum, some, uh, some uh, being placed like unaccompanied children through your offices with sponsors in the interior. And uh, of course, the asylum system now, which essentially is a free pass into the interior of the United States, uh, and due to the backlog in the immigration court system, many of these cases will never be reached, uh, assuming people actually show up for their immigration court hearing in the future with uh, very little consequences. As you know, Title 42, uh, which is the public health title that uh, was implemented because of COVID, uh, will expire in May. Um, I'd like for you to tell us what the administration's plan is to deal with this public health crisis and this uh, humanitarian crisis caused by the lack of any controls of our border. And Senator, I, I will try to concentrate my comments on the work that we're doing at HHS, uh, and I'll let my colleagues speak to the work that they're doing, for example, Department of Homeland Security and others on other aspects of this. Well, I'd, I'd like to know what the plan is. I assume you've been consulted and, and collaborate on that plan, but so far we've not seen anything that uh, has, is credible uh, in terms of dealing with this, and as bad as it is now, which has never been worse, when it comes to the flow of drugs and people across our border. It will get worse if um, Title 42 expires and there's not a adequate plan put in its place to deal with uh, both the flow of drugs and people. Yeah. And, and to your point, uh, because we're having to work under a, a very broken immigration system, uh, as you mentioned, these are the things that happen. I know that, for example, the Department of Homeland Security is trying to move uh, the asylum process in a way that lets us get to these cases quicker and adjudicate them so that way we can move through that process. But in terms of HHS, we continue to try to be prepared because we don't know who will cross that border uh, as a child who's unaccompanied and when we have to be ready to secure them from uh, DHS within 72 hours so they can be in an appropriate setting. And so what we're doing is preparing uh, whatever the uh, eventual outcome is, to make sure that we respect the uh, rights of any child to s receive care that's essential. And we're going to continue to do that at HHS. Well, Mr. Secretary, I'll just give you one person's opinion. I think the Biden administration has completely dropped the ball when it comes to border the border. And unfortunately, we've seen uh, uh, all of these deaths. I went to a, recently to a high school right outside of uh, Austin, where I live, and talk to the parents of, uh, who've lost young people who thought they were taking something relatively innocuous, but it was laced with uh, fentanyl. And as you know, the cartels use uh, industrial-type pill presses uh, to make what looks like a normal pharmaceutical product, which in fact is tainted with fentanyl, which as you know is extraordinarily powerful and uh, small amounts will kill. Um, I want to just say the one thing I would congratulate the Biden administration on is their commitment to implement the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. Senator Stabenow acknowledged what uh, one of the most important parts of that bill that Senator Tillis and Senator Sinema, Senator Murphy and I uh, were involved in, and actually all of the, our colleagues were involved in, at, in one frame, in one uh, way or the other. But we've made the single largest investment in community-based mental health care in American history. And um, I'm, I think that's something that we're all going to be very proud of and uh, will address a huge unmet need. But the last thing I want to say in the f few seconds I have is just to ask for your help. Um, Senator Menendez talked about the workforce shortages. Uh, nowhere is that more apparent than in, in the mental health and physical health delivery systems. Um, we tend to focus, like through a soda straw, on reimbursement rates because the federal government is trying to figure out how can we cut uh, health care costs, uh, make it more affordable. But we have a confluence of problems 
when it comes to recruiting and retaining uh, health care professionals. Uh, we have erosion of the standards uh, for providing those professional services through scope of practice issues. Um, I would like to ask whether you'll, if you'll be willing to work with us, particularly the chairman, the ranking member obviously uh, set the agenda in working on all of these issues as part of the same problem as opposed to dealing just with the reimbursement issues in isolation. Senator, uh, we'll, we'll look forward to hearing from your staff so we, so we can follow up with you. This is absolutely something the president has asked us to, to follow and work on. The president does de uh, dedicate monies to workforce uh, expansion and development and also resilience. So we'll, we'll look forward to working with you on this. Thank you. Senator, Senator Cornyn, thank you again for your leadership, your ongoing leadership on these mental health issues. And I think there's some more opportunities, particularly for public-private partnerships. In our part of the world, Connie and Steve Ballmer have funded behavioral uh, health studies at the University uh, of Oregon. I think it's going to be a model for the country to get more workers. So, Mr. Mr. Chairman, as you know, it was the product mainly of, the, of this committee, the Finance Committee, that made that possible as part of the Bipartisan Board uh, Safer Communities Act. So thank you for your leadership as well as the, that of Senator Crapo. I think uh, that's a big deal. To be continued. You're absolutely right. Next will be Senator Cardin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Becerra, welcome. It's good to see you. Uh, I want to underscore the point of Senator Grassley in regards to the organ transplant issues. Uh, the reform of the OPTN process will save lives. We lose 17 Americans every day awaiting an organ transplant. So this is an urgent issue, and I just thank you for your response and the actions that you are taking. I want to turn to an issue of drug shortages. The wealthiest nation in the world that spends the most of any nation on drugs and yet we have important drugs that are in shortage supply here. According to the American Society of Health Systems pharmacists, 160 drugs were added in 2022 to the drug shortage list. 48% were in sterile injections, making a total of 295 active drug shortages here in the United States. And these are not these are drugs that are critically important to your health care. Some are, are in cancer treatments and other areas. So the president's budget deals with extending the expiration dates, which I think is important. Senator Collins and I have introduced legislation on that to deal with disclosure. Uh, how do you intend to mitigate this challenge that we have in this country? You, you know, Senator, you, 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 I'm glad you raised this because whether it was the issue of infant formula or whether it was the winter flu, uh, we are seeing that in so many cases, the industries that we count on to provide us effective medications aren't ready for disruptions, for a broadside. That's because we've gotten into a system where these industries, to save money, and they're entitled to try to save money, have gone towards a supply chain methodology that essentially says, we're gonna keep in inventory only the stock that we need immediately. And if all of a sudden you have a major increase in demand, you can't meet it. Or if something happens with a manufacturer who has to go down because there is an issue of safety or cleanliness, then all of a sudden the supply goes down and they're not ready to meet the need. And so what we have done is we've begun to do more surveillance over how these private sector industries are handling their supply. We don't Get, we don't regulate that supply, but we want to have more eyes on it so we can make sure they're preparing for that broadside that might come. We're also trying to make sure we help them mitigate any supply chain interruption. So if they get some of their material for their product from overseas, some country, we want to make sure there's not going to be a disruption, whether politically based or uh, supply based, that keeps them from being able to produce. So we'll work with you because this is a big issue. Well, as we saw for the pharmaceutical industry, how they manipulated a market for profits for insulin, the same thing's happening on less expensive drugs where they're changing their production capacities in order to maximum, maximize their profits, which we understand. But since we are the largest payer for these services, it seems to me we can have a stronger impact on their decision making. We'll look forward to working with you on that. Uh, as you know, oral health is closely tied to, to physical health. Uh, the final calendar 23 fis fiscal fee schedule rule expanded dental services 
tied to medically necessary conditions, which means that these services will now be covered under Medicare beneficiaries. That's a step in the right direction. But as you and I know, we have major gaps in both the Medicaid and Medicare uh, programs in regards to coverage for oral health and dental services, particularly in the underserved communities. They are particularly vulnerable. So what steps do you intend to take in order to um, uh, deal with the access to oral health care in America, particularly in underserved communities? Well, as you said, one of the first steps we took is to try to make sure that where we had the authority, we expanded access to dental care, dental care services to folks on Medicaid. And we have made the effort, to, and with your support, to try to expand coverage within Medicaid for dental health services more directly. We count in many respects on our community health centers who are able to use some of the funding they get to expand services, including in dental health. And we're going to try to do everything we can within the authorities we have to expand access because we know an infection uh, that's related to your, uh, your, dent, uh, your dental uh, situation could ultimately impact your overall health. We, you know the story of Diamante Driver, uh, a young man from your state of Maryland who died because at the end a, a toothache, which parents did not have the money to uh, have him go see a dentist, became an abscess and it became an infection, and before you know it, Diamante was dead. It's one of the best investments we can make in oral health to get great returns. Let me just say in concluding that in hepatitis C, thank you for your efforts there. We need to identify those that, are, that have hepatitis C. The treatments are there. It saves lives, and it saves costs. So I appreciate the initiative in your, your budget, and I would hope Congress would work on budget rules would, which would encourage that type of services to, to deal with diseases. We're backing up your hope. Senator Bennett's next. Thank you for coming back and thank you for your service. As you know, uh, Congress acted in a bipartisan way to address surprise medical bills through the No Surprise Act in 2020. I worked with Senators Cassidy and Hassan on that legislation. We built a big, broad, bipartisan coalition, and we, we hope to ensure a level playing field between providers and insurers as they resolve payment disputes. And through the, the dispute process that we set up, both parties were supposed to be able to provide information specified in statute, specified in statute, and the arbitration entities were required to take this information and weigh it equally. But we have heard a lot about how the implementation has been challenged. And to be completely plain and simple about it, Mr. Secretary, we believe the administration is not implementing the legislation as intended. We're seeing lawsuit after lawsuit from providers. Insurance aren't responding in a timely manner, or sometimes not at all. And even when the payment determinations are won by providers, Payers still don't pay providers after the statutory deadline. It's a big mess. And CMS has frozen and unfrozen the process over the last few months, which has led to a significant reduction in cash flows, leaving providers on the hook for tens of thousands of disputes. And while patients are still technically protected, these implementation challenges harm every single patient because they don't know whether providers are actually going to be there to provide the services that they need. So we got to get this back on track, and I'm, I just want to know that I'm willing to work with you and others to get this in the right place. In the budget, HHS requested another $500 million to implement this bill, but I don't see evidence that it's gone well or, or right by congressional intent. Can you give me your assessment of what's, what's gone wrong and how, to, how you intend to reduce the backlogs and legally implement this bill? First, thank you, Senator, for your work in helping us have this critical law passed. But secondly, I don't think you or I knew what it was going to come. And so let me ask for your help. I'm going to plead for your help. We're receiving more than 10 times the number of claims that anyone ever expected. And these arbitrators that are supposed to go through these claims are swamped. And remember, they don't get paid unless they adjudicate the claims. What we're finding is that the way too many, I want to say the vast majority, but way, way too many are frivolous because there's no cost to file a claim. So everyone's just filing all sorts of claims, and these arbitrators are trying to figure out what cases to handle. 
That's what's bogging down the system. But I will tell you this. We are staying true to the law. We are not letting patients get caught in this food fight between the provider of the care and the insurance company that has to pay for the care. We're making sure patients are not getting the bills in the mail saying you owe this money. It's going to be between the provider and the insurer. And what we're trying to do is have a system that works. So I plead with you and your colleagues, help us make sure that we get to the legitimate cases so a provider who's looking for a real payment or an insurer who's saying, hey, you're asking for too much, we can adjudicate that claim. Okay. Well, let's, I've got another question I want to ask, but I think we, we have, I don't know whose fault it is, but we have a system that doesn't work, I think. And so um, I certainly will help, and I'm volunteer Senator Hassan, Senator Cassie, too, to figure out how we can all work together to do it. Se uh, Secretary, I'm writing names down. I, I want, well, you should only write my name down three times, but I'll try to get the other folks. Um, and I want to I want to say again, thanks for your leadership. And just a few months ago, as the chairman knows, the CDC put out their latest youth mental health report. Uh, it it continued what I've heard across Colorado over just the past few years. We have a youth mental health epidemic in America, a mental health crisis in America. According to the CDC report, 40% of high school students felt so sad or hopeless last year that they couldn't engage in their regular activities for at least two weeks. I was saying to my staff the other day that, you know, when I get a call from Colorado that somebody the age of my daughters has died, you know, I no longer ask, was it a car accident or was it leukemia? The question is, you know, was it a, was it, um, was it suicide, or was it fentanyl, or was it a, you know, a gun? And by the way, when I was the superintendent of the Denver Public Schools, we never asked that question just 15 years ago. It's also true for seniors. You know, one in five Medicare beneficiaries have a mental health condition, and among Latino seniors, that goes up to nearly one in three. I know we've done a lot in this committee on mental health, but we've got to do more. And I, I'm glad the HHS budget calls for parity in Medicare Advantage and invest in integrated mental health in a primary care. And this is why I introduced with Senator Wyden, Chairman Wyden, uh, the Better Mental Health Care Act for, Ameri for Americans. Our bill would require parity for Medicare Advantage plans, Part D, and Medicaid, and increase reimbursement across programs for integrated care. I am extremely grateful. I'm coming to the end of my question. I know I'm out of time. I'm extremely grateful to your staff for working with us to draft that bill, and I, I just want to um, ask you, if, as we continue to work on it, whether you'd be willing to work with us on it, because I'm sure you're uh, detecting the same trends in mental health that we are, and maybe with just five seconds you could answer. One second, yes. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Th thank you, Senator Bennett, and thank you for your leadership on this. It takes your breath away what some of these gaps are. You know, we know in Eugene, Oregon, for example, if a young person has a problem in school, in effect has a major breakdown, there is literally no treatment bed for them right. at that time. Yeah. So you're doing incredibly important work. Thank you. I appreciate it. Senator Langford's next. Chairman, thank you. Good to see you again. I, I had a parent that was in my office today, and as you can imagine, the parents that come here to D.C. do a lot of research and a lot of background, and they, when they bring questions, they bring very different types of questions. Their, their particular child had a health care issue, and they were asking about the cost of drugs, and they went through several different proposals that are out there, but then they asked a very specific, pointed, well-educated question about pharmacy benefit managers and said, what is being done? Because that seems to be a black hole and all I'm reading and seeing seems to be a lot of information on that. Now, th that's an area I said, you're very perceptive to be able to go through the different aspects on that. You talk a lot about drug policy, but there's nothing about PBMs and some of the proposals in your budget piece. Now, CMS, we work with them directly on it. And I wanna to talk to you about some of that as well. But for the PBMs in particular, they're not even mentioned once. What's the plan at this point on dealing with drug pricing in the PBMs? And Senator, thank you. And uh, it may not be as directly uh, included within the budget, but the administration is working on PBMs because we know it, it more and more there is a growing concern that the, the middlemen in the process of getting drugs from manufacturer to patient are skimming off a good deal of the money that's being generated. And what we want is for uh, consumers to get the drug at the lowest price possible. I will tell you that 
Uh, most of these issues will likely end up in court, as you can expect. Right. But we're going to try to move to make sure that if there's a middle middleman that's going through the process of making sure a drug is getting from the manufacturer to the patient, that it's done efficiently. And so we could use your help to make well, sure Well, we'd, we'd be glad to be able to work with the administration on that. You'd find bipartisan support to be able to deal with this. Some basic elements of transparency. Obviously, PBMs are very opaque in where, yep. where the pricing is, where the money actually goes. Yep or even the standards for evaluation. Different pharmacies are evaluated different ways, different yeah. months even, where they don't even know the evaluation, the price on it. So getting some standardization. Uh, we've made those recommendations to your team. We'd love to be able to work on that. And if we need legislation to be able to fix it, let's continue to be able to work on that. If I can continue on that same theme, this issue of tiering is becoming more and more important where the drug will be released out. Uh, there's a generic drug that is in released out later in competition, but it's according to the PBMs and the main original manufacturer, it's put on a branded tier, meaning that the, the patient at the pharmacy counter is paying the more expensive rate rather than the generic rate for their uh, pharmaceutical, and it also becomes an issue for Medicare as well. That's not an issue that you brought up on this, but it's a really big issue that we need to be able to address this whole issue of tiering of where a new generic drug comes out, whether they're branded tier or generic tier. Can you help us get to uh, try to settle this issue to lower prices? We'll follow up with you, Senator. Thank you for that. Uh, let, let me talk a little bit about something Senator Menendez brought up as well, uh, and it's this issue of the children in ORR custody uh, that have come across the border. These are the unaccompanied minors. The New York Times published this report uh, that was pretty horrific about labor, but this is not new. This is something Senator Portman and I and several others have worked on for several years, trying to be able to figure out how we can actually manage this. The, the Times actually identified uh, that there is a stat that's 85,000 children that HHS lost immediate contact with them once they were placed in sponsorship. Uh, so that's my first question. Is that number accurate? Uh, because once HHS does the vetting, places them with sponsors, the next question is, do you know where they are, even for those first 30 days? And then when you get to day 31, do we know where they are? And if I can push this a little farther, if they don't show up for their first hearing, is someone from HHS checking on them? Because at that point, they're lost. And, and Senator, I, every week, I get briefed by my team sometimes two or three times a week on this situation uh, with the unaccompanied migrant kids and where we stand. I've never heard that number of 85,000. I don't know where it comes from. Okay. And uh, so I can't attest. I, I, I would say I, it doesn't sound at all to be realistic. And what we do is we try to follow up as best we can with these kids. Uh, Congress has given us certain authorities. Our authorities essentially end the moment we have found a suitable sponsor to place that child with. We try to do some follow-up, but neither the child or the sponsor is actually obligated to follow up with us. And, and we make every effort to follow up with them as best we can. But that is the first 30 days, uh, there's the follow-up that's actually happening there. But if they don't show up for the first hearing, there is no follow-up at that point. Is that correct? Uh, the the follow-up for purposes of the immigration proceeding would be, I believe, through the Department of Homeland Security. Okay. Well, at, at this point, no one's following up. Uh, there are some assumptions that are made there that if an unaccompanied minor has been placed in a home and then they don't show up for hearings, no one seems to be checking on them to be able to figure out, no, are they still at the same address they were dropped off at? What are they doing and why are they not showing up at hearings? I, I also understand uh, that you've called for an audit, a four-week audit in February on that. My understanding is that audit c concludes next week. Is that something that we could get a copy of that audit report as well and to be able to see next week when it's finished? Let me make sure, Senator, uh, when we have that uh, audit finished, if we're able to share publicly the results of that. I, I believe we can probably share most uh, of the information because there is most of the process that we use is public. Right. And what we're trying to do is make sure that our checks on vetting are, are catching anyone who should not be considered a suitable sponsor. And so our audit is for the purpose of making sure that our background checks are fulfilling that mission. Right. I don't know why there wouldn't be a good reason you couldn't share it with this committee. Yeah. Uh, and even if we were seeing it uh, just locked in with this committee to be able to see it and it wasn't public or released, I don't have a reason that that audit couldn't be re released. There are issues of privacy for the children and so forth, but we'll Get make that. sure that we That's probably not kids' names in the report, yeah. but thank you. Yeah. Senator Langford, thank you uh, for bringing up the pharmaceutical benefit managers, what we all know as PBMs. We're going to be having a hearing next Thursday in this committee 
on specifically them. It's a result of Senator Crapo and I having had a number of conversations about it. And I want to let my colleagues have a chance to ask their questions. But this conversation will, uh, will continue. And uh, I hope colleagues, I hope every member can come next Thursday. Senator Cassidy. Hey, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, sir. Um, we had kind of let you, thank you for you know, the dialogue before the meeting. We told you we're concerned about how do we know the people at HHS are working? Uh, so let me put this picture up. This is a picture taken at 10.40 a.m. last Monday at uh, an HHS headquarter. It's like empty. And then we, got, we could have pictures of other parking lots that are similarly empty. Uh, so, um, um, you know, wow. The building's empty. If there's no cars, the building's empty. So we just appropriated $3 billion. Well, first, tell me this, please. Can you give a breakdown of how many full-time employees are at their desk in one of these buildings every day? Senator, when you, um, when you take a look at the workforce at HHS, and we're close to 90,000 throughout the country, um, and working in various parts of the country, uh, some here in headquarters. By the way, headquarters, we have an underground. I, I got limited time, so, so this may be misleading. So tell me, of what percent of the employees are at their desk, full-time employees are at the desk on any given day? And I don't mean to be rude, it's just so limited time. No, and I, I appreciate that. And our, our folks are working full-time. No, but how many are at their desk as opposed to being at home or well, someplace else, a coffee we, shop or whatever? Yeah, we, what we make sure, sure we care about is that they're performing and they're delivering, and that's why... Well, that's not really answering my question because I know the best practices now in many industries is to bring people back in. So is it 5%, is it 10%, is it 1%? How many folks are actually sitting at their desk in a government building when they are working full-time every day? And we have folks who, as they're working full-time... So you, it's and, kind of not a... <laughs> clearly, sir, you don't want to answer that question. And I don't mean to be rude, but you don't. And that kind of begs that the answer may not be flattering. Uh, when CMS put out a uh, request for employees uh, as regards to the complex drug negotiations that was in a recent bill. Uh, the posting offers generous telework policy. What does generous telework policy mean? If somebody hired into that program, how many days a month would they be expected to actually be in a government building as opposed to wherever they wish to be? And, Senator, that would depend on the workers. Some people have never left their job, even during the height of the I'm not speaking campaign. about leaving their job. I'm speaking about being at their desk. And not speaking of some, but of a percent, if I may, because anecdotes are not data. You're limiting the scope of what we do. We have investigators who never sit at desks. I would say take as somebody who traditionally would have been at their desk before the pandemic, please. And depending on, on the work that has to be performed, they will be in the office at times. Sometimes they may be in the field. But what's Can I ask just for, uh, for the record, because obviously it doesn't seem, Mr. Secretary, you're prepared to answer that question. But for the record, can you give us a percent of the actual workers who have full time, who would be expected to be at their desk, not an inspector in Louisiana, but someone else, uh, if you can give it that for the record? We could follow up, Senator. Um, do we, do you, can, can the agency provide us VPN data or some other measure of accountability that shows that the people truly are working from home? We can certainly show you that they're performing. The fact that 700 million shots have gone into the arms of Americans. For but do you have that VPN data? Because initially when the pandemic started, we saw VPN data that showed a double digits number of employees were not turning on, turning on their VPN every day. And so it suggested they were not accessing emails, for example. Uh, so is that data still being collected? If so, can you share those results? I could try to get back to you on that. Uh, now, if you live in the D.C. area, you get a work differential. Um, so you get a little bit more. Your cost of living is more. Um, so is someone who is in this building with an empty parking lot, uh, is someone in that building not knowing where they are currently working, uh, are they still getting a cost of living adjustment as if they are working in Washington, D.C.? Yeah, first I have to tell you, uh, Senator, that that is not the headquarters of the HHS, uh, of the Department of HHS. Okay. We, it we, is CMS headquarters. Oh, okay, okay, so uh, what we can get back to you on. Is someone working, as I said, we have been coming in day in, day out. But, but, we but, have but, been but, but, day in, day out. But let's assume that because I've, I've heard from people within the agency that in reality people are only required to come in one day out of a month. Uh, and this has been something we've heard from CDC along those lines, but I've also heard from somebody who's working at CMS. Now, I assume that you have a global policy because you have the same union negotiating for all of HHS. So, I, I, so it's, it seems to me as if it's going to be the same policy wherever you are. So my question is, if you are working from home consistently, 
And originally you were based in D.C. Are you still getting a cost of living adjustment, even though we frankly don't know what we're, you, you might be flying in one day a month, but living in West Virginia? Again, Senator, I'm not familiar with this statistic that you're throwing out that says. But is there a cost of living adjustment for people who are taking advantage of generous telework? There is certainly a cost of living adjustment for folks who work in high cost areas. Uh, even if they are teleworking? If they are performing their work, uh, they are entitled to receive a cost of living adjustment if they work in a high cost living area. And when you define work in a high cost living area, do you mean telework? I mean, for they could be in, their VPN could show them in DC, but they could be in West Virginia. So are they getting paid as if they are living physically and showing up every day and parking in that parking lot every day uh, in the DC area? So you would have to take a look at the particular job description to find out what type of work is done and where they are located to be, to be able to make that determination. Um, I yield. I thank uh, my colleague. Uh, next is Senator Hassan. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member Crapo for having this hearing, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Um, I want to start with um, a discussion of state opioid response grants. I was really pleased that the department's proposed budget includes $2 billion for state opioid response grants. These grants, which I've worked since 2017 to secure and expand, have really helped my state significantly improve our response to the fentanyl crisis. Last year, you and I discussed this program's impact in New Hampshire. New Hampshire's been really hard hit by the fentanyl crisis in particular. We discussed the importance of continuity of funding because it helps states plan and avoid drastic cuts. And just before the hearing, we were talking about a program uh, in Rochester, New Hampshire called Hope on Haven Hill, which focuses on treatment, recovery, and transition for um, pregnant moms and parenting moms who have substance use disorder. And the continuity of funding um, has been really critical for them to be able to develop that program and really help these uh, women um, turn their lives around and get better. So in last December's appropriations bill, Congress acted on a bipartisan basis to require HHS to, and this is a quote, prevent unusually large funding changes from year to year in these grants. I know from our past conversations that you understand and share this really important goal. How does HHS plan to implement this statutory requirement to prevent year to year funding cliffs in state opioid response grants from states like New Hampshire? Senator, first, I, I have to say thank you because in many ways, th these are your babies. Uh, these SOAR grants, you've, you, you championed them and you made it possible for us to actually get money into communities who need to deal with opioids and um, you're saving lives, so thank you for that. The president has followed your lead. He's calling for some $2 billion in investment. That should help a lot of these agencies that are administering the funds to get services to folks who are trying to get off of opioids, a way to know that they're going to have a consistent and hopefully permanent stream right. of support because the last thing you need is be there one day but not right. the next. And the, the work that you all are doing is helping us not only make sure that we institutionalize these, these programs under the SOAR uh, grant program, but that we also make sure that it stays consistent so that we don't, we don't have one day you have the resources to do it, and the next day you got to close down all these shops. Right. But we'll, we'll work with you on that. Well, I appreciate that. I, I really just wanted to make sure that your staff and mine will continue to work on this. Um, it's everything from um, certainty and predictability for patients, um, as well as being able to recruit people into the workforce to do this work, right? So um, I look forward to working with you and your staff on that. Thank you. Um, now I want to turn to discuss Title X family planning funding. Um, I want to thank you for including robust funding for maternal and reproductive health in the department's budget, including doubling funding for Title X family planning to $512 million. Along with Senator Warren, I'm leading a letter to appropriators echoing that request. Title X is the only federal program dedicated to providing family planning. And it's historically been a program that's been underfunded. Um, but we all know that in light of the Supreme Court's decision last year to restrict women's reproductive freedom, this is a program that's more essential than ever. So can you speak to the importance of Congress appropriating this essential Title X family planning funding? And then I want to ask you one more question, so if you can be a little bit brief. 
family planning hasn't received a boost in funding in eight years. Yeah. It's time. We know how essential it is. It's not just funding for one type of care. It's funding for family planning services. Indispensable. The president's budget recognizes it. We look forward to working with you to get that across the finish line so we can actually expand services and get them to communities that absolutely need them. Well, and it's absolutely essential to a woman's capacity for self-determination and dignity. So I appreciate it very, very much. Um, I want to turn to one other issue, which is the MAT Act implementation. At the end of last year, the Mainstreaming Addiction Treatment Act, MAT, which I led with Senator Murkowski, was signed into law. This bill eliminates needless, outdated restrictions on health care providers that prevented them from prescribing buprenorphine, a critical treatment option for people struggling with fentanyl and other opioids. I know that you and the administration more broadly are strongly behind this new law, and I really want to thank you for you and your colleagues' work to support it. Can you please speak to the importance of these changes and what HHS is doing now in coordination with other agencies to expand access to buprenorphine by ensuring that health care providers know about these changes? Uh, Senator, um, gosh, where do I start? Medication-assisted treatment is critical because it's one of the ways you save a life. Yeah. If you can get buprenorphine uh, to an individual <clears throat> before they OD, You've just saved a life. If you can try to remove the barriers that kept a physician from participating, participating in a program to be, be able to prescribe a life-saving drug, you've saved a life. And when we were able to really remove the X waiver uh, cap, we were able to make it more likely that a physician would want to participate in this program and not find themselves sub subjected to uh, law enforcement oversight as if they were uh, encouraging drug use. Uh, what we did was we liberated the system to actually treat drug addiction and take away the stigma. So we, we look forward to working with you on that. Well, I look forward to that too. And just, uh, I'm over time, but one of the critical things here is going to be making sure that we work with law enforcement yes. as well as healthcare providers to stock bup in pharmacies and make sure that uh, primary care physicians and other primary prescribers uh, know that they can prescribe this life-saving medication. So thank you. I look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you. And thank, thank you for your work, Senator Hassan, especially on Title X, an enormously important program, and it hasn't come up yet today. Um, Senator Johnson, you're next. Hey, Mr. Chairman, uh, Secretary Becerra, welcome. Do you believe it's important that we understand how the coronavirus originated? Absolutely. Is there somebody in your agency, your department, that is uh, spearheading the investigation to determine that? Uh, we have done a number of, uh, taken a number of initiatives to try to move forward there, uh, for including having our OIG take a closer look. So but you're, our, you're saying it's the OIG? I mean, is there somebody within the department outside the Inspector General that is spearheading this? Somebody in charge? CDC, NIH are also doing a scrub. We're all trying to get as much information. The difficulty is that we're not getting a lot of co cooperation from uh, some of the sources externally that probably can give us. Let's, let's, talk about, let's talk about lack of cooperation because I'd say the same thing's true in terms of. Uh, cooperation out of the agencies. Do you believe the public has a right to know uh, how the agencies are spending their money and how they're operating? The public does have a right to know, yes. Uh, there's two primary methods for that. You have uh, FOIA, Freedom of Information Act uh, requests, and then you also have congressional oversight. Uh, would you agree that uh, FOIA is generally su subjected to more redactions than congressional oversight would be? Uh, I, I wouldn't say that, but we do have to be careful what goes into the public domain. We're respecting confidentiality and privacy. I, I, I understand. There are some exceptions that are very explicit out there. That A lot of them make sense, but uh, I, I would argue, I think many people do, that congressional oversight really is not subject to those same redactions, particularly when we have security clearances and we can take a look at classified information that, that is you know, appropriately redacted under FOIA. Um, let me give you a couple examples. Uh, we requested these documents, by the way, in, in June of 2021, under a FOIA request, court ordered uh, 4,000 pages of uh, different documents, primarily emails of, of Anthony Fauci, uh, were produced under the FOIA. Um, in September 2021, we, we, well, that month, we had five members of Homeland Security Governmental Affairs uh, ask for those same pages unredacted. And there's a law that says you shall turn that over to us. Uh, in September 2020, when we started working with HHS to produce those documents in an accommodated process. So we narrowed the 400 pages, 4,000 pages down to 400 to get those things unredacted. 
Uh, they weren't handed over to us. What we did, we were allowed to read them 50 pages at a time in a reading room and take notes. Some, some productions we did get, for example, we got this document, um, dated February 4th, between Anthony Fauci, uh, Jamie Farrar of the Welcome Company, and Francis Collins. You see the, the redactions here. This is the same document produced under FOIA without the redaction. So, so now we know what was redacted, and this was redacted, by the way, under uh, B4, which is trade secrets. Uh, one thing that was redacted here is Anthony Fauci saying, question mark, serial passage in ACE2 transgenic mice. In other words, humanized mice. They, they were talking about, uh, Farrar is, is writing to Francis Collins, remains a very real possibility of accidental lab passage in animals to give glycans. Um, he said that uh, Eddie thinks it's a 60-40 lab side. Farrar said he's thinking it's 50-50. Again, this is February 4th. There's nothing to do with trade secrets in that redaction. Another example. This is February 2nd. Again, this is when they're, they're understanding that they funded this dangerous research, and now they're in the cover-up mode. Um, here's what we got in our production, the, the heavy redactions. This is what was released under FOIA. Now, this was released under the B, uh, B5 exception, which is privileged information uh, within or between agencies. Again, this is with Jamie Farrar of the Wellcome Trust. So we, we had redactions with, you know, privileged information. It didn't apply, and we still had it redacted. I, I don't have time to get into that. This is completely inappropriate, and by the way, we're down, you have produced 350 pages to us in the reading room. For over a year, we've been asking for the last 50 pages. This is what the 50 pages look like, okay? Now again, I would argue congressional oversight should not be subject to the same redactions that were applied under a FOIA request I'm asking you, will you commit today to provide our oversight? And Senator Paul is on this now. Again, we had five members of Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs under, under a law that says you shall provide this. Will you commit to provide us the last 50 pages of communication between Anthony Fauci, Francis Collins, Jamie Farrar, as it relates to the origin of the coronavirus? Will you commit to that? Senator, I absolutely will commit to make sure we follow up with you on your request to get some of that information. Again, this is, this is in compliance with the law that you receive the information. I, I don't know what particular statute with regard to disclosure was applied here, but you are absolutely entitled to the information that by, by law a member of the Senate or the House yeah, should get but again, it's, follow it's, up. You're not complying with the law because you're redacting things, for example, under deliberate process between and within agencies, and it's communication outside of the agencies with the Welcome Trust. Again, these redactions are not complying with the law. So again, I, I'll appreciate we will follow up with you. I expect to see the unredacted 50 pages very soon. We, we can comply with the law center, but we absolutely will make sure we follow up with you. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Next is Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary, it's always great to see you. Thank you. I, before I get to my questions, I do uh, want to quickly touch on Medicare Advantage. Um, seniors in my state rely on Medicare Advantage to access affordable, high-quality qual health care. I often hear uh, from Nevadans how vitally important this program is to supporting their health and the health of their loved ones. That's why I have been a uh, long supporter uh, of um, uh, Medicare Advantage. This year, I am proud to have led the annual bipartisan letter, and I, I believe there were 57 senators of my, my colleagues that signed on to the letter urging the administration to preserve and strengthen the program. Last week, I spoke with CMS Administrator Brooks Lashur about the proposed updates to the program for 2024 and what they mean for Nevadans. And I, I will just reiterate today, Mr. Secretary, that any efforts to address overpayments in Medicare Advantage should support program integrity and preserve the sustainability of the entire Medicare program without disrupting access, without increasing cost, or jeopardizing 
the quality of care. So as you move to finalize 2024 policies, I urge you to prioritize the program improvements that benefit patients and deliver value to seniors and taxpayers. So just wanted to start with that. Secondly, I too notice all the purple here in the room. Thank you to the Alzheimer's Association, to everybody who advocates. It's something that dealt with in my family, with my grandmother. So, so appreciate your advocacy over the years. Thank you. You will always have a supporter with me. Secretary Becerra, let me, let me talk about the commercial prescription drug inflation rebates. Last year, we, as you well know, we passed historic um, drug pricing policies in the Inflation Reduction Act. This law is already working to lower drug costs for our seniors with Medicare. Importantly, the Inflation Reduction Act penalizes drug companies for raising prices uh, faster than inflation. Uh, however, as it stands today, these companies are only held accountable for hiking drug prices in the Medicare program. That's why I'm introducing a bill to extend the inflation rebate uh, penalty to include drugs used by people with private commercial insurance. My bill will ensure that Nevada families, as well as our seniors, are no longer squeezed by drug companies' outrageous price hikes. So, Secretary Becerra, I'm glad to see the goals of my bill uh, reflected in the president's uh, budget proposal. How would the inflation rebate penalty for the commercial market impact drug prices for patients at the pharmacy counter, as well as healthcare payers like employers and unions? Uh, Senator, well, first, thank you for that effort. Uh, we want to help as any way we can because we know what happens. Take insulin. Insulin was only to apply to those who are on Medicare, 67 million Americans on Medicare. Today, the three leading manufacturers of insulin have said they're going to drop their price of insulin for those who aren't on Medicare, so those in the private insurance market. And so we see what happens when you introduce competition into this. The prices come down because everybody now has to compete to get your business. Your bill, I suspect, would do the same thing. It would introduce that competition in the private in, uh, insurance sector, so it would complement what we do in Medicare, and at the end result is you drop the price for a whole lot of Americans who aren't on Medicare. Thank you, I appreciate that. And let me just add that my commercial prescription drug inflation rebate, rebate bill has the potential to generate significant savings for the federal government. In fact, CBO projected that a similar provision would save $34 billion over 10 years. So uh, I thank you. Let me, let me jump to something uh, very quickly here as well. Mental health, I've heard my colleagues are talking about this. As you well know, this is such an important issue for me as well, and I, I support uh, my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Uh, for working to address this. And I appreciate the support for the crisis services in the budget proposal uh, around mental health uh, and the funding 23 uh, bill, or fiscal year 23 funding bill. The significant expansion in funding for 988, the new suicide and crisis lifeline has helped communities manage uh, increased demand and call volume since the line went live last summer. I know, I talk to my folks in Nevada all the time about this. On this committee, we're very focused on what comes next. What happens when someone in crisis dials the line and needs somebody to come help or somewhere to go for that treatment? Uh, I was proud with uh, the chairman uh, to pass increased funding for 988 and crisis care through mobile units in the December omnibus bill. Uh, but we have more work to do. So my, I, my question for you is in your view, what is the biggest challenge to improving crisis care coordination when we're talking uh, the mental health support that's needed across the country. Senator Workforce, we, we need to hire up more folks, pay them decent wages so they'll stay in the field because right now we know that health care has a shortage of workers, period, but mental health even worse. And so if we really want to say to somebody, call 988 and you're going to get real help, we have to make sure that there really will be real help at the end of that call. Look forward to working with you because I'm hearing the same thing. I see it in my state uh, and across the country. So thank you. Thank you. I, I thank my colleague for questions and especially the points about MA, Medicare Advantage. We've worked very closely on this committee with Chairman Casey, who's also put in a lot of effort on this at the uh, Aging Committee. And just a quick, quick word. Uh, I believe Oregon, Nevada, and Minnesota have the highest percentage of senior citizens in MA in the country. And having spent a lot of time in these precincts since my days working with seniors, I've come to the conclusion that unfortunately not all Medicare Advantage is created equal. There's been some very good MA, 
There's been some not so good, and we're going to work very closely with our colleague to make sure we get the former and have less of the latter because her points are very well um, taken, and we're going to work closely with the administration to make sure that uh, we recognize that kind of distinction, and I, I appreciate her comments. Next is Senator Tillis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Secretary Becerra. Thank you for being here. Before I make some comments or questions, I also want to recognize the Alzheimer's Association. You all were in my office, or the North Carolina delegation was in my office yesterday, and my staff had been meeting with them. I looked to my staff and said, are there any priorities that you all have discussed that we don't support? They said the answer is no. We support them all, uh, including a dear colleague letter for funding for NIH. So. Uh, you can count on my support, but the reason I did that is because I wanted to talk with them about something that, that should be on your agenda, and it relates to research, and it relates to prescription drug pricing, and I'll get to that in a minute, because I want to uh, use a few examples. I, I know that we've had some members talk about the great advances, Secretary Becerra, in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. I think, based on patterns that I'm seeing in the industry, uh, you could call it the Investment Reduction Act. And, Mr. Chairman, I have three documents that, uh, without objection, I'd like to submit to the record. Without objection, so ordered. Two are related to Eli Lilly, one uh, to another uh, player in the pharmaceutical space that have said, we're making business decisions to drop small molecule research and other things because the time that they would need to recover the investment they anticipate is not there, and so you can expect reductions in small molecule research. You can expect reductions in an eye drug uh, that they were trying to expand. You can see the effects of not getting well-intended policy right. And, and Mr. Becerra, or Secretary Becerra, Congressman Becerra, I, um, I think the work that you did on a bipartisan basis, whether it was the 25th, uh, 21st Century's Cures Bill, or even more importantly, the heat that you took from your side of the aisle to get Trade Promotion Authority tells me you're a person that likes to get to a, a, a positive end, a productive end. The only reason, uh, the primary reason I didn't support your confirmation, though, in full disclosure, is the position you've taken on uh, March in rights. Um, and so uh, I, I'm not going to have enough time to get to many questions, but I think it needs to be said that I believe we're going, about, we're going about it the wrong way in terms of the haircut that needs to be done to get pre prescription prices lower and not at a point in time and not at the expense of other research and investment that's necessary. And I tell everybody in the industry, I believe that there's a haircut coming, but I haven't heard any member talk about who needs to be in the barber shop. And I think it needs to be pharma. I think it needs to be the pharmacy benefit managers. It needs to be the insurers. I just wrote this down as notes. Medical, the medical profession, the prescription, or the, uh, the uh, pharmacies, the FDA, and the legal community. If you're really going to fix the fundamental problems with drug pricing and look people in the eye and say you're doing something not just to claim victory, as, as it was done with the IRA, but something that's sustainable, every single one of them need to be, they're all a part of the value chain, they all need to be at the table, and we need to get it right. Because you may be able to correct me if I'm wrong, I haven't seen a single successful, sustainable uh, solution to this, uh, or, or at least a part of the solution, except when By and Dole passed something uh, not too long ago. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit for the record an op-ed that was, um, that was written by Senators uh, By and Dole in 2002 that said we never intended for their legislation to become weaponized. Without objection, so ordered. And in spite of the fact that the NIH has uh, recently just rejected imposing price controls based on price, now we have a work group that's going to consider price as one of the ways that we go about getting down on this industry. If we do it, we're going to have a longer window uh, for work, the very promising work that's been done for Alzheimer's. Uh, I've got a vested interest in that. I was a, a part-time caregiver to my grandmother. I got a vested interest in broader research. I've got two potentially deadly, uh, one incurable and one, incur uh, one curable disease in my body. One's prostate cancer, the other is Weg <coughs> excuse me, Wegener's granulomas. Both of them are being managed. Uh, prostate cancer has a lot of promise, provided that it's within that window. 
Uh, Wagoners is a rare disease. Uh, it's not going to be something that we're going to see a cure for, particularly if we don't get this right and incent the private sector to invest in things where they may have to walk away from it, like an Alzheimer's drug, after a billion dollars of investment. And so I told the Alzheimer's Association, please study up on the, uh, on the attacks on intellectual property protections. Uh, take a look at what the administration's done with TRIPS waivers and other things really threatening the, uh, the return on investment that these companies have to make. And please make sure that that's a part of your pitch when you come to these members of Congress and expect them to produce a prescription drug pricing strategy that they can look you in the eye and say it's going to produce year-over-year -year results. Thank you for being here. Senator, Senator Tillis, thank you for your point with respect to the nature of how pharmaceuticals, uh, particularly as it relates to the regulatory system, have a breakdown at every step of the way. That's what Senator Grassley and I found in our mammoth um, research report. If anybody's having trouble sleeping tonight, you can go through the scores and scores of footnotes, yeah. and it starts with pharma, but it's the PBMs, it's the it uh, distributors, it's every step and of the way. And Mr. Chair, it's the FDA too. We, no, learned no so much, we learned so much from COVID, and we figured out how we could accelerate approvals under emer emergency use authorizations. The fact that we would have those snap back post-pandemic after they've been proven to work, uh, to me, is meaning that we're not, we're not learning some of the good things that came from that stressor. Your, your, your point is correct. Senator Warren and then Senator Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I also want to say welcome to the Alzheimer's Association. I wore my Alzheimer's purple today. Um, we have a very active group in Massachusetts, and I just want to say a special thank you for all of the advocacy you do on behalf of so many people we've lost to a terrible disease, so thank you. Um, I want to talk today also about Medicare Advantage. You know, every February, the federal agency that runs the Medicare program releases a report outlining how Medicare Advantage, or MA, insurers are going to be paid for the following year. MA is a program that allows private insurance plans to offer Medicare benefits. Now, taxpayers pay these insurance companies a set amount per beneficiary, and this amount can go up if the beneficiary is sicker. The more diagnosis codes that a beneficiary has, the higher the payment. And whatever insurers don't spend on care, they actually get to keep. These companies have built entire businesses around making beneficiaries look as sick as possible, and unsurprisingly, government watchdogs have discovered widespread abuse. This year, CMS made a few updates to ensure that the government's payments more accurately reflect what it actually costs to pay for the care for beneficiaries in this program. And in response, the insurance industry has kicked into overdrive, sending an army of lobbyists to claim that the changes will hurt Medicare. So let's go through this. Let's start with the basics, Mr. Secretary. Under your proposal, will total payments to insurance plans that run Medicare Advantage go up or down? Total payments will go up. So they will go up. CMS is proposing to increase payments to MA plans next year. In other words, the insurance companies overall are going to get more taxpayer dollars, not fewer. But insurance companies want a lot more taxpayer dollars, not just a little more. So they're kicking and screaming, and they even shelled out millions of dollars for a primetime Super Bowl ad opposing the proposal. Now, these Medicare Advantage companies are also peddling industry-funded studies that claim Medicare premiums would go up and benefits would be cut if your proposal is finalized. Mr. Secretary, are those claims accurate? No, they are not. Benefits are not cut. All right. So numerous experts agree with HHS's assessment. When Medicare Advantage was created, the insurance companies argued that they could provide better care than the federal government at a lower cost. But for years now, MA plans have been using a long list of tricks and games to take advantage of loopholes in the government's payment rules to squeeze literally hundreds of billions of extra dollars out of the program. Researchers at the Kaiser Family Foundation found that profit margins for MA plans are double those 
for other kinds of insurance. In other words, because of lax rules, running Medicare Advantage plans is a lot, lot more profitable than running any other type of insurance plan. And the insurance companies don't want the party to end. So, Mr. Secretary, are the private insurance companies that run Medicare Advantage actually delivering health care for seniors at a lower cost than traditional Medicare program run by the federal government? The, the numbers show that it costs more to provide care to seniors in Medicare you, through the Managed Care Medicaid, Medicare Advantage program than through the traditional program called fee for service. So the cheaper way to do this is actually just to run people through the Medicare program. It's not to say there aren't some programs that work with Medicare Advantage, but overall, that's what the data show? Yeah, we're talking overall. So if you lump everyone who's in the Medicare Advantage program, the managed care program within Medicare, and those who are in the traditional Medicare program called fee for service, the per uh, beneficiary cost is higher under managed care, or what we call Medicare okay. Advantage. Exactly the reverse of what they promised they would deliver. They said, hand it over to us and we'll do this cheaper. You know, in fact, according to the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, which is the independent congressional agency that studies Medicare, the private insurance companies running MA have never delivered health care at a lower cost than traditional Medicare in the entire history of the program. So I just want to say I urge CMS to finalize this proposal. I can't get an ad on the Super Bowl, but I hope that having you at this hearing will have some influence on this. Uh, it's important to take these steps to strengthen Medicare. I also want to say I don't think it's enough. CMS needs to double down on its efforts to crack down on industry abuses in the MA program. I stand ready to work with you and to help you do that to ensure that Medicare beneficiaries get the care that they have rightly earned. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank, thank you, you Senator Warren. Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Secretary. Thank you for being here. And I am so grateful we have the Alzheimer's volunteers here. We have a great group in Tennessee. And I so there's some back there. Love seeing them. But you know, Mr. Secretary, the budget that you brought to us, it is full of things that get in the way of research. It would prevent new drugs and therapies from coming to market. It would weaken those IP protections. And this is, it would expand big government. And it's something that does cost us uh, some concern. I want to return to the issue of telework. I know that Senator Cassidy discussed this with you. Um, adding to the list of how many HHS employees are working telework, I would like for you to identify the essential and non-essential components of that list of those that are, are teleworking. And also looking at you and your team personally, uh, when you look at telework, how many days have you spent in California during COVID-19? Thank you, Senator, for the question. With regard to my status, I know that uh, requests have been made for my schedule, and we will try to provide as much information yes, as we can. Yes, I think it would be great if we were able to get uh, the schedule for you, your security detail, and the records expense reports so that we could see how much. The reason this is important is because you are overseeing an agency that is the equivalent of a tenth of our nation's GDP. And I think that it is vital that you be on site in overseeing that department. So can you even ballpark how long you were in California and how often you were absent? Uh, I, I don't get to California very often when I do. It's usually because I'm doing work uh, and I yeah, travel. During, uh, during the pandemic, because I think it's important that during the pandemic that you were there. Not and often. I want to read this back to you. 2019, talking about the border crisis, you said of President Trump, and I quote, and to say that it's an emergency, and then within 24 hours, having said it, go off to Florida to your Mar-a-Lago resort, 
when you think there is a national emergency, I think all the evidence, including what Donald Trump says and does, proves this is no national emergency, end quote. So by your own standard, you would equate COVID to not being a national emergency if you're spending those hours in California and being absent from the headquarters. It's time to get people back to, back to work. Um, Faith-based organizations. We have um, 8,000 faith-based organizations across the country that are irreplaceable members of the nation's child welfare system. Senator Ossoff and I are going to do some bipartisan work at Judiciary Committee on these issues. Tennessee relies heavily on faith-based agencies for services like foster care, adoption, uh, child, uh, different child and family services, and the recruitment of those adoptive families. Now, under your leadership, one of the first actions that HHS took was to rescind waivers issued by the previous administration, which allowed faith-based groups to place children with families in accordance with their sincerely held religious beliefs. The president's budget now proposes to combat sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination by penalizing foster care and adoption providers for operating in accordance with their tenets of faith. So with nearly 400,000 children in the foster care system, would you not agree that placing those kids in loving homes is a greater priority than advancing an agenda? Senator, thank you for the question. There is no doubt that being able to place a, any child who's in foster care in a loving home should be our top priority. And we want to make sure that that's always possible. We want to make sure laws okay. are not violated then that would prevent that child from going to a loving home. Let's do this. Let's have you submit how many potential foster and adoptive homes would be forced out of the system if the president's budget were uh, put into effect on that issue. I want to go back. I know Senator Menendez talked to you about the Office of Refugee Resettlement. And this department is responsible for the care and placement of unaccompanied children who come across the U.S. border, correct? And are you aware of the recent New York Times article that really reported on the large numbers of unaccompanied children who are being placed with exploitative sponsors and working long hours in dangerous conditions. I'm aware of the fact that a number of children have been reported to be working in ways that are violating our law, but I'm not aware of the situation you mentioned about being placed in exploitative circumstances. Uh, so if you could if clarify okay. that a bit more. I, I will be happy. Mr. Chairman, I'd love to submit that article for the record. Without objection. That's, that is wonderful. Thank you for that. Now, the agency, the Times reported that under the Biden presidency, the agency cannot find 85,000 children and that the agency lost contact <clears throat> with a third of the migrant children that are coming into the country. So I'd like to know what you're doing to find the children and what you're doing to make certain that these children are not being trafficked. Senator, first, uh, those statistics that you've mentioned, as I said previously, uh, in regards to another question by one of your colleagues, is uh, those are unfamiliar to me. I have no idea where those statistics come from, if they're based in reality or not. And we do everything we can to make sure any child, before we allow them to be released to a sponsor, that that sponsor has been vetted. Okay. To, uh, the vast majority of these children end up with a family member, immediate family member, as a placement. So. Uh, some of those statistics that are being thrown out there that are, don't seem to be based in fact really would go contrary to what actually we've done. Okay, my time is over, but let me tell you, we have to get this thing straightened out. At any time you had 10,500 children under your care, the money works out to about $1,400 a day to take care of these children, and you can't find these children, we have to get it straightened out. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank my colleague. We're going to go to Senator Daines. I'm just going to put one document into the record. Reference was made of how the notion, according to some, of making sure Medicare can bargain to hold down the cost of medicine would somehow 
reduce innovation and damage future drug creation. The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office looked at this issue specifically and estimated, their words, minimal impact of new medicines coming to market under Medicare drug price negotiation. This was an issue very important to me because clearly what we wanted was more competition without reducing innovation. That was the finding of the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office. Senator Daines. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Secretary, thanks for being here today. Um, there are several concerning proposals in this budget, uh, including yet again the omission of the Hyde Amendment to allow for taxpayer-funded abortions. It's clear the administration has no intention of protecting the precious lives of the unborn. In fact, since the Dobbs decision was first leaked in May of last year, over 80, 80 pregnancy resource centers and pro-life groups have been attacked and vandalized, as have hundreds of churches that support the pro-life cause, some even in my home state of Montana. Mr. Secretary, given the continued assaults against pregnancy centers and churches, would you publicly condemn this violence? If you want to do it right here, I'd be happy to hear it. Senator, I, I don't believe anyone here would condone violence against any American, whatever the sort. Uh, and certainly, I would hope that we could all work together to prevent any American from being harmed simply because they are either trying to exercise their rights or receive services they might need. So uh, I would love to join you in sending a message to all Americans, please respect people's rights and also make sure that we're not abridging people's rights. You publicly condemn what's happened? Would you condemn this violence? We, I would condemn any sort of violence yeah, against thank, any thank American. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, thank you. Um, as you are aware, over 30 million seniors and people with disabilities in this country are enrolled in the Medicare Advantage plans, including one quarter of Montana seniors due to the added choice and control it offers beneficiaries. Rural states like Montana face unique challenges when it comes to recruiting and retaining physicians. Oftentimes we're a long ways away from, uh, from larger communities. And the changes to the CMS HCC model in the proposed rate notice will further jeopardize Montanans' access to care. My question is this, what data can you provide that might show that the current rate notice will not impede access to care in rural and underserved areas? Senator, thank you for the question because it is very important. The rate notice actually provides a greater level of funding than, the, than last year. And what we do is we try to make sure that it is funding that goes for a particular service and not to line the pocket of a middle person in the process. And what I will say to you, especially because of the rural communities that you represent, we need to make sure every dollar that the Medicare program puts out for Medicare recipients gets to service a Medicare recipient. And what we're finding is that too often Programs are gaming the system. And for example, as you heard earlier, uh, the programs, uh, some of the plans are claiming that a Medicare beneficiary are, is sicker than what the person may be. As a result of upcoding that person, you get more reimbursement, even though you may not provide the care that a sick person under those circumstances would need. But what I will tell you is that at the end of the day, whatever we have done with this rate notice, it does not cut any benefit provided by Medicare, and in fact, it actually provides more resources to those who provide services under Medicare itself. I want to shift gears um, and talk about Medicare taxes. Uh, Mr. Secretary, the President's proposed budget raises Medicare taxes because the President claims to care about the solvency of the Medicare program and that the wealthy should pay their fair share. However, there's mounting speculation and this is as reported in the Wall Street Journal, that according to his own tax returns, the president improperly classified the money he made on book deals and speaking events, allowing him to dodge over $500,000 in Medicare taxes. This is again according to the Wall Street Journal. How can the president propose tax increases on Americans and call for the wealthy to pay their fair share when he potentially owes a half a million dollars in taxes to the Medicare program. 
Uh, Senator, uh, let me respond on the Medicare program. The president's budget would make sure that not just for today's seniors, that they would get the benefits they expected when they paid into the Medicare program for decades, but it actually now makes it clear that moving forward to the next generation, that they would receive the same level of benefits. There would be no cuts, and that's the beauty of the president's proposal. Yeah, but, but, but he do, figured out a way to do that. The question is, is, don't you think this pledge to protect America's seniors might ring a bit hollow in light of the president's own hypocrisy of dodging $500,000 in Medicare taxes? My, my suspicion, Senator, is that the president would uh, challenge the way you've described his circumstance, but what you can't challenge is the fact that his proposal actually increases benefits under Medicare and it moves it forward in strengthening it for the next generation, something that no other president that I've seen when I was here in, in Congress for 24 years had really done, and I have not yet seen anyone in Congress really pr produce a plan like the president's that would provide that guarantee for seniors of tomorrow that they will have the protections they expect under Medicare. Secretary, I'm out of time. We lost our chairman. Okay, looks like Chairman Casey. Chairman Casey is recognized by himself. <laughs> Thank you very much. Senator Whitehouse is letting me go ahead of him, so he gets a lot of credit. Mr. Secretary, great to be with you, and thank you for your testimony and your enduring commitment to public service. The members of the uh, Alzheimer's Association are here. We're grateful for your, for your presence and the determined advocacy that you bring to our offices year after year. We're grateful and continue to work with you. Mr. Secretary, I'm going to talk to you about long-term care in the context of two settings. I'll mention one, but I really want to ask you about the second. The first is in this broader context of what can only be described as a caregiving crisis when it comes to seniors, people with disabilities, and I would include children in that as well. We are in that crisis, and one of the one of the paths forward, I believe, not, not the only, but one of the paths forward is uh, greater investment in home and community-based services, so-called HCBS for seniors, people with disabilities, and the, work, or the workers that do that heroic work. I have legislation to do that that I know you're aware of, the Better Care, Better Jobs Act, and we have much to do on that. Uh, but I want to set that aside for a moment and talk to you about the, the other setting, which is institutional settings, long-term care, skilled care in a nursing home by way of the leading example. And in particular, uh, the special focus facility program that um, I've worked to oversee for a number of years to make sure that we're, we're investing in oversight that's particularly um, centered on those facilities that have had the greatest problems. We've, when you look at that number, about 97% of nursing homes are not on that list. That's the good news. The bad news is the 3% that are uh, have real problems in terms of care. I was pleased to see that there's a 39% increase in funding for survey and certification activities of nursing homes in the President's budget. Uh, I'm grateful for that. But I also think the fun more funding is needed to expand the special focus facility program. How would additional congressional appropriations toward nursing home quality and oversight be beneficial to better protect residents in these facilities. And Senator, um, thank you for focusing so much attention on this. While I think most Americans would say it's great that the majority of nursing homes don't fall within this program, there are some that do, and there are Americans who are in these facilities, and we have to make sure that we protect them. So the money that the President proposes would help us do more oversight, it would help us do the surveillance to find out if these uh, poor performing uh, nursing homes are increasing services and improving services. And it would let us take action quicker so we can prevent a mishap, a, an accident, or perhaps death to occur in one of these facilities. And I'll submit a question to the record with regard to the plans to revise the program, the Special Focus Facility Program. My second and final question is about uh, countermeasure uh, injury compensation. We know that 700 million COVID vaccines were administered in the country, but there are instances where there are injuries in, uh, related to any vaccine. I know they're rare, but they, they do happen. I was encouraged to see that the HHS budget requested significant increases in funding for administering two programs, 
the, the Countermeasures Injury Compensation Program and the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. I've written to uh, Administrator Johnson at HRSA earlier this year about the Countermeasures Injury Compensation Program, and I want to make sure that we reiterate the message from that letter that individuals with these COVID-19 vaccine injury claims are waiting too long for adjudication. Um, so we want to make sure that people aren't waiting years for that kind of compensation. What additional resources or authorities do you need in order to speed up the process and respond to these claimants faster? Senator, your help in getting that money across the finish line will be indispensable because we do need to try to move through those backlogs. And one of the things that we would do is if we get additional resources, it try to, is to try to make some process improvements in, in trying to get those claims through. So we would set up, for example, an injury table that lets us better target who's being harmed, what the issue is, and whether or not they qualify for some compensation. But the, the biggest issue right now is just having the, the wherewithal, the resources to get through the number of cases because all these Americans deserve to be compensated if they were injured. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Secretary, um, your, your, uh, your, friends, your friends and admirers in the first state send their best. Thanks uh, very much for joining us uh, today. Uh, last uh, year, Congress passed and President Biden signed into law the Inflation Reduction Act, as you know. It was not just the most significant climate legislation in our country's history, but also included landmark provisions to lower the high cost of many prescription drugs. I was happy to join a number of my colleagues in uh, uh, authoring those provisions. But our work uh, to lower uh, drug prices, you know, is not done. We have a real opportunity to continue tackling the cost of prescription drugs through the reforms to the pharmacy benefit manager system. And there's bipartisan interest on this committee and outside of this committee to, uh, to do so. Uh, my colleague and, and friend, our colleague and friend, Senator Lankford, brought up, I believe, PBMs earlier while I was in another hearing. And I uh, uh, want to follow up on um, his, uh, uh, his uh, question. Uh, what, here to go, what common sense PBM reforms do you think should Congress, and in particular this committee, the Finance Committee, consider that will lower the cost of prescription drugs for American families further? And will you and your team at HHS work with us to move those reforms forward during this Congress? Senator Carper, th uh, thank you for the question. Um, and, and as you know, this is an area where whatever move or change we make, we probably will find ourselves facing a complaint filed in court. Uh, there is money involved in this. Uh, but what I will tell you is that transparency is so critical to know how these middlemen are operating. Uh, so we understand where the money is going and how the drugs are getting to people who need them from the manufacturers. So I would say to you that we're going to try to do the work possible uh, to try to increase oversight and transparency of the way PBMs operate. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, with you about the implementation of youth mental health uh, provisions. When I was privileged to serve as governor of Delaware, we put a public school nurse in every uh, public school. Uh, we put uh, opened up uh, wellness centers in just about every high school in our state. Now we're extending those, as you may recall, to our middle schools and to our elementary schools. But um, uh, throughout uh, the eight years I was privileged to serve as governor, I, we focused making sure that kids get the care that they need uh, where they're at, in many cases in schools. Last Congress, I was co-chair, uh, along with Senator Ca Cassidy of the Youth Mental Health Working Group, alongside of uh, my colleague from, our colleague from Louisiana. Several of our priorities were included in the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, as you may recall, including important provisions that make it easier for schools to provide mental health services to students and to get reimbursed for those services under Medicaid, and I think maybe under the CHIP program as well. I understand that HHS is now in the process of implementing those uh, important provisions. I like to say, find out what works and do more of that. In that spirit, uh, could you just share with us some best practices from states that are doing a great job providing mental health services to students in school-based settings so that other states can learn from their success? 
and, and Senator, you're right. You probably can identify a number of these programs that are really having success. What I will tell you is that we're trying to partner with those that have really gone into the schools to provide kids with access, early access to preventative behavioral health, mental health services. One of the programs we have is Project Aware, which really works closely with students to ensure that we're reaching them when they're manifesting uh, certain issues regarding uh, behavioral mental health. The other thing we're really gonna try to push, and here's where we need the help of the states and governors, is to see if we can get Medicaid into the schools far more deeply and quickly because many of these kids would qualify for Medicaid services. Why wait till uh, a parent applies and finds out that the child is el eligible to receive uh, mental health services at a doctor's office or at a hospital when, as you mentioned, the, the beauty of having a nurse at a school and maybe have behavioral health specialists at a school where you get reimbursed through Medicaid funding for having those uh, professionals there helps us get to those children quickly. Yeah. Last question is federally qualified community health centers are up, as you know, uh, for reauthorization at the end of this fiscal year. As you noted in your testimony, the president's budget includes a pathway to double the size of the program size over five years and greatly expand its reach. I was pleased to see the president prioritize community health centers in his budget. Uh, as co-chair of the Senate the Community Health Center Caucus with several beloved uh, centers up and down my state that provide critical health uh, care services to my constituents. And uh, uh, my, my question, the last question, uh, Mr. Secretary, is can you share your thoughts on the, maybe the top three areas, the top three areas where Congress should focus when it comes to reauthorizing the federally qualified community health center program? Well, uh, the community health centers really delivered. They saved lives. M tens of millions of Americans got their COVID shots at community health centers. They are the centers that are oftentimes providing dental health services to Americans who otherwise don't have dental insurance. And so the two or three top priorities, expand them. There are parts of rural America that don't have good access to community health centers. Uh, let them expand their services. Some don't provide uh, OBGYN services because it's expensive. And at the same time, please, please pass the president's budget on community health centers because we expand the scope of community health centers and their funding so we can continue to have those great successes for so many Americans. Good, thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, I'm Tom Carper, and I approve that message. Very, 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 very good, and we, we're glad you're on the committee, so thank you. Senator Whitehouse. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. As usual, I wanna bring up my graph. Uh, which we've updated to show that from the original CBO federal health care cost projections, uh, this actually happened with a spike, obviously, for COVID here, and that brings us up to today. And in that backward-looking period in the past, that's an actual $2.2 trillion savings in health care spending below what CBO forecast. And if you bring the forecast forward, uh, in the next 10 years, the budget period, um, the projected savings are 6.9 trillion against the extended earlier CBO projections. So that tells me that something is going on out there, and I think it has a lot to do with the improvements in the quality of care, the improvements, the move to value-based care, the success of accountable care organizations, and perhaps also some of the pharmaceuticals that have come our way. But I do think that this is worth taking a good hard look at because if we can get those kind of savings out of the healthcare system without taking away benefits, we should be all over that. And I know for sure that the ACOs in Rhode Island, Integra and Coastal Medical hit it out of the park and produced significant savings, wrote big checks back to Medicare and their patients loved it because the patient experience got so much better. And um, so I commend that point to you, and as I always do, and uh, hope we can make more progress there. I also want to uh, go back to something that I um, have referred to you before, which is my efforts to try to get an end-of-life care model set up in Rhode Island using the CMMI pilot. I'm not asking the rest of the world to come with us. Just let us try it. We've been working for years. This began under uh, CMMI Director uh, Bowler, 
And then when he left, it was Groundhog Day, and we started in with his successor. And then the administration's changed, and it was Groundhog Day again. And now it's uh, Liz Fowler. And the things that we've been asking for is a pool of waivers that really relate to how people near the end of their lives um, can use. The three-day rule. It is preposterous to take somebody who's within perhaps weeks or months of dying and the family thinks they need to be in a nursing home and you insist on two nights and three days in a hospital on the way there. That's frightening, that's expensive, that's you know, just unjustifiable. So we'd like to see that way for people who are uh, in that category. Uh, curative and palliative ought to be able to proceed in parallel. And home health resources ought to be available. Um, if you are towards the end of your life, but you can still walk out into the garden, that should not bar you from getting home health services uh, because going elsewhere to get the services is, again, more expensive and cruel to the family. So I really want to try to land this and try to get uh, CMMI to say yes. The three-day rule you've already agreed to under COVID. It was waived for COVID. The curative palliative distinction you waive for the Medicare Choices Rule. The home health services you waive for, uh, met for CMMI models. So it's not as if I'm asking you to do things that you aren't sensible and eligible and ready to go. I just want a package so we can land this program in Rhode Island that I've been working on, I think now for eight years. Would you please help me with that? Very persuasive, Senator. Very, very persuasive. And absolutely, let me work with you on that. Because as you said, many of these items are already in place or have been used. Yeah. And yeah. I think and everyone CMMI says, no, you should do it our way. No, just do it our way, right? We're going to be the pilot. We'll put it all together. We'll make it work. You can measure and model us. We'll work with the ACOs. We'll do whatever they want. But it, it, I've had enough Groundhog Days. Yeah. Let, let's follow up because I think CMS would like to get there as well. Uh, I, I, again, we're heading in that direction, so let's see if we can get there with a good model. Thank you. And um, just because I see all the terrific purple shirts uh, in the back, um, my Rhode Island Alzheimer's folks were in yesterday, and they were eager to have uh, Medicare approve uh, lecanemab and aducanemab for early onset Alzheimer's. And if there's anything that you can do to help facilitate that, I think that would be uh, particularly helpful and uh, welcome. And then last question, um, we would like to try to make sure that medication-assisted treatment for people who have opioid disorders can uh, be accomplished through telehealth. We did that through COVID. Can we please find ways to extend that? Because it seems to have worked very well, at least according to everybody in my recovery and treatment community. That last part was a question. Yeah. Should we do more of that? Can we, can we keep doing that? Yeah, and, and uh, there, Senator, uh, we will work with you because that, that goes beyond HHS. It goes into other of our departments as well. So it's a joint effort to work on that, and we can follow up. Thanks, Chairman. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. Senator Brown, uh, all, the, all the chairmen here. Senator, Senator Whitehouse. Senator Secretary, Brown. nice to see you again. And Senator Weiss, thank you for your work, especially on Alzheimer's. We also appreciate that. Um, Secretary Becerra, as you know, the Norfolk Southern uh, derailment East Palestine, I was there again yesterday, has left many community members with questions. They want to know how the toxic, ex toxic exposure they and their loved ones experience will affect their health. It's important in the process of searching for and receiving answers about these effects, their concerns are taken into account. I know some of your agencies, has been, some of your agencies have been there since the very beginning. And you're aware of that, of course. Thank you. I know that moving forward, HHS will be heavily involved. Yesterday, um, one of my trips back to East Palestine, I visited the mobile health clinic set up partially funded by HRSA. People are still coming in seeking help for symptoms related to exposure. And of course, they fear for the future. Uh, people are, are frustrated. They're scared. They feel like time is of the essence. They're afraid when the cameras leave that the help leaves. Uh, can you assure me that HHS will continue to move with urgency uh, in response to this disaster? Senator, we were there from the beginning. We're not leaving. Uh, and we've been on the ground. And, and as you said, we've also provided resources, for example, to that community health clinic. Thank you. And I know that 
even though the president didn't go right away or, or you didn't go right away, that your people were there and made a real difference. Thank you. I want to talk to you about drug pricing briefly. Briefly, One of the victories of the Inflation Reduction Act was capping Medicare co-pay for insulin at $35 a month. Walk through what that means for an average Ohio senior who needs this life-saving drug. For the average Ohio senior, it's probably about $500 they get to keep in their pocket. $500, just like that. Because before they were paying $100 for that insulin a month, some paying up to $150, $200 a month. But on average, so some will save much more, some will save maybe a little less, but on average, every senior in, in Ohio who needs insulin, $500 extra dollars in your pocket this year. By the way, if we had done this last year, that would have been $500 last year you would have kept in your pocket. And the year before, there's no reason why a drug that we know costs no more than about $10 to manufacture should be costing seniors $100, $200. Thank you. That was said so very well. Thank you. Switch gears for a moment. My last question, Mr. Chair. I know there's a vote. Talk about Medicare Advantage, a great program that serves millions of beneficiaries well. I'm concerned some seniors overpay and aren't receiving the benefits they deserve. Some Medicare Advantage plans misrepresent how sick their patients are to CMS in order to take more money from taxpayers. MedPAC says without fixing this, taxpayers and seniors will be paying billions of dollars more than they should be. MedPAC estimates it costs, it costs us over $20 billion, $20 billion in 2023 alone. Uh, seniors are literally paying for this in the form of higher premiums. Fixing this sounds like a great way to save money, but I keep hearing that saving this money that is bad, that it's going to hurt our seniors, put them in danger of having their benefits cut. Explain to me why that's just not true. Well, it's, Senator, it's not true because there is nothing that we're doing in this advance notice that would require any insurer to cut Medicare benefits. In fact, they remain the, the same. Those benefits must be provided by law. What we do is we take out that extra charge and we're going to try to get back some of the money that we were overcharged at a, as a Medicare program that should have been used to provide more services to Medicare recipients. And so we think it's the right thing to do to make sure that every dollar that someone paid in when they were working and saw their deduction from their paycheck is used to provide Medicare once they are retired, not to help line the pockets of those who are overbilling. And we're going to go after any overbilling where we can. Good. And I know you will, and your record is that. So thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Chairman. I, I thank my colleague. Before he leaves, I just want to say thank you to Senator Brown, and then we'll go to uh, uh, Senator Young, because he remembers in 2019 when we were in this room, and we weren't going to be able to get everything we wanted in that bill, and we came up with an anti-price gouging strategy to protect consumers, and just this week we saw the fruits of it because the administration announced lower coinsurance payments for 27 drugs in Medicare Part B as a result of the penalties for price gouging. And you see it particularly with drugs like Humira, which is sort of a poster child for why you ought to have more bargaining power. So in this room, Senator Brown was incredibly helpful with that, and I want to thank him. Senator Young. Thank you, Chairman. Good to be with you, Mr. Secretary. Welcome to the committee. The world is facing an antimicrobial resistance crisis. I, I know you know that superbugs make us all more vulnerable. They undermine treatment of everything from common ear infections to uh, cancer treatments and, and routine surgeries. Uh, we're seeing more resistant, uh, resistance to an infection right now than we ever have before. And uh, blessedly, there's been a lot of public attention that, that has been paid to this. Uh, the antimicrobial market is failing. Uh, they're hard to develop. They're almost impossible to sell for at least five years because of the need to hold new antimicrobials in reserve to prevent resistance to those antimicrobials uh, from developing. The administration ha has stated that drug resistance is a crisis. Uh, and the budget highlights a program to provide an incentive for novel antimicrobials, similar to the Pasteur Act, which is bipartisan legislation that uh, I have introduced with Senator Bennett. Just days later, after the budget was submitted, CMS rolled out a list of 27 medicines that the, the, the Inflation Reduction Act is going to penalize for price increases. Five of them are antimicrobials with prices that are overall well below the total expenditures of other classes of drugs. 
and they're generally used for short durations for acute infections. These are infused medicines, uh, the kind that you get if there's, there's nothing else available to you. So, Mr. Secretary, I'm, I'm going to give you an opportunity to tell me how will penalties on these antimicrobial uh, medicines help our superbug crisis? First, Senator, you're the only one that has asked a question about antimicrobial resistance, and I thank you for that, because we don't think about it. But we're losing the effectiveness of some of these uh, drugs, like penicillin, and we count on it. But because it's being overused or misused, we're losing the effectiveness of those drugs. And so thank you for posing the question. Uh, secondly, remember that the only drugs that will fall on this list uh, uh, to rebate back some of the money is drugs that were raised beyond the rate of inflation. And, and they can't be new drugs. And so these are drugs that have been on the market. And that manufacturer would have to explain what, why they had to increase that drug beyond the rate of inflation, in some cases, dramatically beyond the rate of inflation. And so we're trying to be careful here. Uh, and we're, we're going after only those drugs where we see the price is being hiked dramatically. The price increases uh, on, on these antimicrobials are, are based on relatively low overall cost compared to many other disease treatments. Um, I don't think that patients are going to see much benefit from the penalties that are imposed uh, by the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, if any at all. Um, it seems like an, an, a pretty arbitrary penalty to me that, that could impact development of, of new uh, antimicrobials, which you just indicated we really need to develop them. Yeah. And I would love to follow up with you any way you'd like on that because you've, you've touched on something that's really important. We have to figure out a way to have a consistent flow of new drugs that combat bacteria. And as you mentioned, it's a tough business. It, it, there's not as much money in it as you might think. And so definitely interested in following up with you in well, any way you'd like. I am work, uh, I'm interested in working together on this. Uh, I know the administration, through their uh, budget proposal, uh, has indicating something, uh, they, they support something seemingly similar to the Pasteur Act. Maybe you can just share with uh, the committee how that proposal, uh, you imagine, might strengthen the antimicrobial pipeline. Uh. Part of what we think may be in the solution is rather than have a manufacturer produce a good drug and now try to market it and f depend on the market actually receiving the drug and buying it, is maybe have more of a subscription model where what you do is you say to the industry, come up with a drug, and like these subscription services, Netflix and all the rest, everybody pays in a little bit. This way there's always money in the pot and these manufacturers have an incentive to go forward with their production and, and creation of the drugs because they know that there'll be money in the pot. Most of these manufacturers are afraid that there won't be a market for their drug. Sounds very similar to the Pasteur Act and, and uh, all the more reason we should work uh, together on this moving forward. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could just uh, add a, a very quick question about organ procurement, something you've been such a leader I, on. I was, I was just gonna commend you because yesterday we got some good news that the administration is going to be receptive to recommendations that you and others uh, work with all of us on to have a more competitive system and not just give out the contract. So I was just getting ready to praise you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, and and, and uh, I'll just pointedly ask the secretary Please. on topic here. Please. Uh, getting OPO process data has been a real challenge. Uh, the chairman and I have, have uh, both requested this data. We think it, it's, it's consistent with our oversight responsibilities in ensuring that uh, more organs are available to save more lives and extend lives. So will you commit to release OPO process data in line with the bipartisan calls from this committee? Senator, we are, we're working to change the way we handle organ procurement and transplantation. Uh, and we're definitely interested in working with you on this subject. And I don't know if you heard, but we just announced that we're doing three specific things that are changing the dynamic in this, in this space. We're going to call for more data transparency uh, from the contractors. We're actually going to open up competition for the contract so that the same contractor that's had this for years and years doesn't just expect that they will get the contract. And then we're also 
trying to, uh, and the president's budget calls for more resources to actually modernize our IT because if we're not keeping up with technology, we're losing time, which could be uh, letting an organ go to waste. Those seem like the right priorities. I, I would say that I hope the OPO process data is, is forthcoming, consistent with the data transparency focus. Thank you so much. Thank my colleague, Senator Brasso. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, welcome back to the committee. Thanks for taking the time to be here. Um, as you know, as a physician, I know the importance of protecting Medicare for future generations um, and stopping waste and fraud and abuse are critical for, for, for all of us, and we have, it's a bipartisan priority. The, um, late last year, I was joined by my colleagues on the Comprehensive Care Caucus in sending a letter to uh, CMS, and the purpose had to, was to point out the proliferation of new for-profit hospice providers. And I think about the hospices in Wyoming, Central Wyoming Hospice that I'm very involved with in Casper. We have some around the state of Wyoming, community involvement, people volunteer, go to events, raise money, help, and they, these are amazing centers that provide care and comfort and compassion. You know, most troubling is that your own data shows many hospices now who are pro the proliferation of these new for-profit hosp hospices, they're actually sharing the exact same addresses. I'm trying to figure out what exactly is going on here, why this is happening, and do you share my concern regarding this pattern of this sudden growth of these Medicare-certified hospices in certain parts of the country? Absolutely. And We've actually conducted some unannounced site visits at some of these hospices that were identified in, the, in that article. Yeah. What, what are you finding out in terms of, in, are, we being, are there bad actors out there? Are there things we can do to curb them so that we can prevent some of this waste, fraud, and abuse? We, we will absolutely share some of that information, but no doubt that what we're looking for is to find out if they're taking advantage of people, uh, if they're defrauding the American taxpayer, and if they're abusing of the privileges that they have by being able to provide these services. You know, I'd point out there's a bipartisan group on this committee and in this body that, that want to assist you in that and help you and share the information that you come up with so we can put an end to this sort of thing. As someone who cared for his dad, uh, giving, uh, offering hospice care as best my family and I could, uh, we are absolutely with you on that. Th thank you. The, the next is, you know, rural health remains a top priority with me. Met today with the Wyoming Alzheimer's Association. There are a number of people here in the in the audience today uh, listening to you testify, wearing the, the sashes, representing family members and others with, with Alzheimer's. So the, I am encouraged that there is a new class of Alzheimer's treatments. Uh, it's giving families some hope that they may have more quality time with their loved ones before the disease takes hold. It's not a cure, but there, there's, there's, there's hope there. And we, we just need to make sure that what's available in certain locations could also be made available to our tribal communities and to our rural beneficiaries. You know, the, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, they have a policy for coverage that is with evidence development. And then the, the it was requiring additional clinical trials or registries that could create logistical challenges for people in rural areas, as well as the providers who are trying to take care of them, uh, because they're not all eligible based on where you are. So how is CMS plan to ensure that those with Alzheimer's in rural settings and tribal communities gain access to, to therapies which are currently FDA approved? And Senator, I think this is where we all would agree we have to do more work together, but you know, COVID taught us that uh, telehealth flexibilities let us reach people more directly, more efficiently. We would love to keep those telehealth flexibilities in place. We would like to make sure that uh, a, uh, an actual skilled, specialized provider is available in these rural communities, so we're trying to expand the number of people who actually go into the profession. Uh, but this is where we can all team up together to figure out how we better serve our, our communities, especially in rural America. Yeah. And, and specifically with FDA approved drugs, unless you're part of this kind of this next generation follow through, harder to get those, can't actually get them in rural communities, tribal communities, based on your location, even though that it is FDA approved. Yeah, we, we look forward to working with you on, on that subject. Thank you. Then I wanted to get to uh, rural health clinics. There are about 5,200 centers for uh, Medicare and Medicare services, certified rural health clinics. Uh, they provide outpatient services to all across the country. Uh, the Census Bureau no longer defines urbanized areas. Uh, it was previously defined as urban areas of 50,000 or more. They've kind of changed that. 
but the rural health clinic statute requires that the rural health clinics must be located in areas that are not an urbanized area as defined by the Census Bureau. So they don't define them anymore. Um, so, you know, so there's kind of a lack of policy. So what we're seeing is that rural health clinic applications are currently being either inappropriately rejected based on assumptions of what the new policy is or blocked by states waiting for some clarification from CMS. And I, I know you're aware of this. Could you just hold forth on that for a bit? Yes, thanks for pointing that out. CMS is in the process of trying to provide some guidance to clarify that. But Senator, I will say this. If there is a particular facility clinic that believes it was denied access to funding and so forth as a result of what the Census Bureau did, please have them contact us. We'll, we'll do that. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before he leaves, I just want to thank um, my, my neighbor. Um, those are important points with respect to rural care, uh, and I'm not aware of these um, for-profit uh, hospice issues the way my colleagues talked about them, so I'd like to know more about those as well. Well, thank you. Thanks so much, Mr. Chairman. I thank, thank, I thank my friend. All right, let's see. I believe we've got a couple of other senators along, uh, along the way. Senator Cantwell? Okay. Mr. Secretary, you've been very patient. We really appreciate uh, that. Um, what we wanted to do when we set out three hours ago before your infinite patience is to show that working families and the middle class can get ahead in this hugely important area. I've always felt since my days when I was director of the Great Panthers, if you and your loved ones don't have your health, everything else goes by the board. It's the most important issue, the most important issue. And what we've set out to do here is to show that we can help working families and seniors and the middle class get ahead and uh, making sure we reduce the deficit. Those two things are not mutually exclusive. We can do both. And we've certainly showed that with respect to prescription drug cost containment. I have one other question um, for you. And, uh, it is as much a statement as uh, anything else. We've seen the great bipartisan interest over the last three hours in this committee for advocacy for Alzheimer's uh, patients, and it is just so urgent. And I just want you to pass on uh, to the department. We work often with uh, CMS Administrator Chiquita brooks uh, Lashore, and if you will just convey that I will be calling her very shortly to talk about how given what we have heard today about Alzheimer's, how she can lead this effort to speed up access for Alzheimer's uh, treatments and, uh, and services. I think that that's... As, as a general rule, we're not supposed to advocate clapping. And so I probably have a conflict of interest here, so go, go figure. But, I think, Mr. Secretary, seriously, we've seen how strongly uh, the committee feels. We've seen how strongly the country feels. This is urgent, urgent business. Please, as I say, let uh, the administrator, uh, Ms. brooks Lashure, who's juggling a lot of stuff and juggling it very well, to know I'll be calling her about speeding up access. And uh, thank you. We'll be working with you often in, uh, in the days uh, ahead. And I thank you for your patience uh, this morning and your professionalism. And with that, Committee on Finance is adjourned.